Give me five seconds. You're Throw on, my, on your best background. I'm, oh, there you go. Hi, everybody. I'm Kyle Lickott, your host today for another episode of VCTV. Uh, we're super excited to have you back uh, today on this Wednesday. Uh, today's topic, I, I'm joined by a, a few outstanding guests who joined us last week, and we wanted to continue the conversation to go one level deeper uh, and maybe even jump into the matrix if we're lucky, uh, as we were doing pre-show. Um, but we want to talk today about, uh, is this the make or break it moment for digital assets? Um, you know, we, we covered a lot last week uh, around what was happening and changing around uh, blockchain and around fintech, the industries themselves, and digital currencies continued to come up a top of mind, uh, so, along with decentralized finance and many of the other topics that we're going to cover today. So I want to welcome back uh, a few of our, our guests and friends to go a few levels deeper and, and really talk about, is this it? Um, you know, is this where we take it or is this where we don't? And then kind of what does the future look like ahead? And also um, what pieces are missing and what pieces need to be added uh, for this to, to actually happen and, and take effect. So without further ado, I will let uh, Agent Smith 1 and Agent Smith 2 um, have a, a, a quick introduction and also a shout out to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for making all of this uh, happen and us look professional as we do today. Agent Smith One, Jesse, yes. welcome to the show. Uh, a quick, well, a quick introduction and, and kind of how you got into the space. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Jesse Proudman, uh, CEO of a company called Strix Leviathan. We run a quantitative hedge fund uh, focused on digital assets. Uh, I have been in the space uh, since mid 2017. Uh, my last company, Blue Box, was acquired by IBM in 2015, and I spent about two and a half years at IBM the last year working on a blockchain-focused accelerator uh, for IBM Ventures, um, and then left IBM at the end of 17 and started Strix Leviathan in January of 18. Rockin'. Welcome. Welcome. I want to dive into IBM Ventures and what you did there. I think there's some cool, cool stuff with the fact that uh, they're tied in with Hyperledger and, and some of the other uh, core pieces of technology that plays a role in this. So we may come back to that later. Miko. Yeah. Hey, uh, too. my name is Miko and uh, I'm actually a general partner with Gumi Cryptos Capital, which is a venture fund that invests in the space. Uh, you know, um, it's great to hang out with uh, some friends. Alex uh, is here uh, in the house, Jesse also. So, you know, it's, it's pretty nice to uh, just have this, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, like a, tea party so you know I'm, I'm pretty excited about it uh i'm also a co-founder with evercoin uh, which is a secure mobile exchange and wallet uh and uh i've been in this space uh since uh probably late 2016 or so and um you know just really looking at it from an open source uh financial infrastructure perspective so uh, that's that's kind of what i have to to toss in here i love it uh alex the, the the legendary Alex who who is uh, running around. So I will give him a quick introduction. He is the the founder of Celsius. Uh, when he's able to jump on here, we'll get a little bit more proper of an intro. But uh, I don't know if he needs much more than that. Alex, welcome to the show. Hey guys, yeah, sorry, my battery was dying, so I had to grab my charger. And no worries. No so worries. yeah, welcome to the show. Yeah, good to be here. Um, Quick background, uh, a serial entrepreneur. I've, uh, you know, I've, I've dabbled with uh, mostly internet communication, infrastructure stuff, and uh, actually looked at fintech over the last 20 years. I was looking to for like an entry point in fintech and couldn't find anything that was disruptive. Everything was like incremental. Uh, evolutionary I don't do evolutionary if there's no revolution <laughs> not interested so so uh, uh, so crypto was really definitely uh, kind of hit on all the on all the points and and I think uh, uh, that's a topic of this of this panel right is 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 this the perfect storm are we uh, about to to hit the the, the takeoff, you know, we're like, uh, the rockets are ready. Everything is, uh, is there. The countdown is, is has been finished. So yeah, we've been counting down for 12 years since Bitcoin was created. Right. So, 
So I think a lot of people are, um, um, I, I, I wrote about it this morning actually, it was an interview with Finance Magnets this morning. They, they published the article that basically said that like it's, it's never seen more uh, um, opposed, more people in the opposed positions, right? Longs and shorts battling it out that's what we do we lend either dollars or bitcoin right to to all these guys so we we usually we either lend a lot of bitcoin because everybody wants to go short or we lend a lot of dollars because everybody wants to be long right now it's like we we fully lent out on everything which tells you that uh, there's a lot of disagreement about where we're going next and you can see us kissing that ten thousand level again and again and again and retreating just a few minutes ago it was like just Horrible to see, right? We we pumped uh, five hundred dollars of Bitcoin and then got crashed in a few minutes later. Like so, somebody dumped a huge amount of Bitcoin. So so it's really this is a very difficult level um, uh, that we have to break through to to get to new highs. Well, and, and with with that being said, let's just go ahead and kick it off with continuing on that. I mean, we're we're teetering you know, that 10K mark when it comes to Bitcoin and digital assets themselves on, on the currency side are, are fluctuating constantly uh, still, right? There's not really much stability in, unless you get into the stablecoin environment. So is this really a make or break it moment? And, and if not, or if so, why? What is going to make this happen and what's going to take it the opposite direction? And Alex, just I'll let you continue to roll and and then we'll, we'll go around. Yeah. So look, there there are still a lot of people who say Bitcoin's a scam. Bitcoin is a waste of time. It's imaginary system, uh, and um, so so the, the the number of new people we're adding is really the the most important count, right? Because uh, if you if you're adding speculators who just come in and out, you're not really adding. Uh, you're not broadening the base, right? Because these guys are are in when there is a, when there's a lot of volatility and they're out when there's not when they can't make money. But when you're adding users and when you're adding use cases, then you're broadening the base. And when you're broadening the base, uh, you're going to have uh, higher valuations for something that has limited supply. And, and a lot of people confuse. A lot of people got excited about the digital dollar and all kind of other stuff. And I'm like, having a digital dollar and putting it on some blockchain has nothing to do with scarcity. Like, it's not a Bitcoin. It's not an Ethereum, you know? So, so people are really, again, because they don't go into the details, they don't understand what a blockchain is in the first place. They miss the point of what it, what's so unique about the Bitcoin. Why is so many, why are so many people are so excited and they left everything they used to do and they're focused on this thing. They look at us like we have uh, six fingers or something, you know? No, I think that's a, uh, I think that's a good point. And, and, it's easy to jump on on key words, but not pay attention to the underlining technology and, and what it means. Miko, I, I see you just chomping at the bit to get in on this. So sure. same question to you, make or break it and following on to Alex. Yeah, I'm gonna make, Jesse. The, I'm gonna make the counterpoint at some point about this kind of like existential make or break moment. But I think for, the, for now, like I really wanna run with this because I think it's, uh, to me, I'm really most interested in pressures so I think pressures are, are super interesting because it's really interesting to watch like, you know, pressures are able to break systems, pressures are able to kind of expand systems, you know, and I think one of the things that's happening in this macro is that there's unprecedented pressures going in all different directions. But I would say that, you know, I think Alex kind of alluded to this and I think one of the things that's happening across the boards in, you know, just about every uh, major country is just unprecedented money uh supply right so you know Fe federal reserve up to six point uh, last count one three trillion in balance sheet you know that's a that's unprecedented and then another thing that's unprecedented is that you know when you look at the stock market you know the federal reserve bank is now buying uh you know corporate uh bonds i mean that that's that's capitulation right like that's a really really crazily unprecedented macro so like you know when you think about pressures right like you're thinking about the 
you know, confluence of kind of political, economic pressures, and then like governance pressures, trust pressures, you know, and, and fundamentally at the base layer, economic pressure. So, you know, what, one of the things that's really critical to try to understand it are sort of what are the things that are happening. And, you know, to me, if you look at sort of Bitcoin, the sort of granddaddy instrument of this asset class, the idea of it being sort of almost a pressure release valve. You know, so so to me, like making the positive case for what you were talking about in this macro, you know, yes, there's an opportunity for it to release. You know, I think Alex was spot on when he was talking about uh, kind of use cases. And I think to me, the thing uh, this morning, I woke up with a new a neologism, a new word in my head, which was which I call uh, hedgel. Right. So people are really into like hodl. I know that's a, you know, ac actually, Alex has an awesome uh, Celsius t-shirt. That's the HODL t-shirt, you know, which I'm a big fan of. I, he gave me one of those, uh, in New York. Um, <laughs> great, great shirt. You know, HODL is the, a battle cry. And I think it's HODL is super important, right? Because HODLers are actually users. Those are users according to Alex's definition, right? Because they're using it as, and so my word is hedgel. Uh, you know, and it's hedgel because it's a use and what they're using it for is they're using it to hedge. Right. And to me, I think that's <clears throat> it's almost like people are rediscovering it for that function, you know, and so and that's a real function. That's utility. Right. Which is I'm hedging. Right. That's a that's a function. You know, it's speculating is the thing that's different. But hedging is not it. Hedging's different from speculating. I will I will make that case today, uh, which is those are two different things. Anyhow, hedgel. 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 We're all the new word of the week. All right. <laughs> all right. Jesse, as a hedgler yourself, uh, anything else to add? <clears throat> Hedgel fun. I'm just a straight speculator. <laughs> uh, let's be honest. Uh, I mean, I, I think this use case question is, is really important uh, because by far and large, the, the only actual use case we have right now, particularly for, for Bitcoin, is, is this HODL uh, mentality like the this yeah. store of value argument is the use case um, yep. nobody's using it as a payments mechanism um, it, it doesn't function well for that uh, and so and sort of all of these ecosystem tokens these platform tokens like those are still largely experiments so that the use case really is uh, the store of value and uh, and having assets on your balance sheet that sit outside the bounds of the traditional financial system. We did a, a post on that a, a couple weeks ago, six weeks ago. Um, that this asset class is interesting to us because it's sort of like this whole world that sits outside of the bounds of, of the traditional finance system with its own, uh, its own behavioral uh, processes and, and systems. Uh, so that, that's interesting to me. Uh, the, the challenge is if the use case is solely sort of hedging or holding or sitting outside of the, the bounds of the traditional financial system. Uh, that, I mean, that's, a, again, it's an interesting use case, but to sit through these drawdowns that exist in this market uh, for the majority of market participants is incredibly painful, right? If you bought at $20,000, if you bought at $18,000, if you bought at $13,000 uh, and yeah. you're sitting there looking at your money halved or more, uh, like you feel like a fool uh, and that's not a good feeling. You don't feel like you succeeded. You don't feel like you're, you're some brilliant person sitting outside the bounds of the traditional finance system. You feel like you were the idiot in the room uh, and you bought at the top. And uh, so the, the, the challenge there with the volatility that exists in this market is that uh, as sort of the momentum and the excitement gets building. And as we add these additional market participants that, that Alex is so correct that we, we need, um, they, they often kind of get burned time after time after time. Uh, and it, it becomes this question in my mind, like how many times do those new participants, are, how many times are they willing to get burned uh, before they're just going to give up on this entire asset class? Uh, you know, I think the, the Goldman Sachs piece that came out that called Bitcoin not an investable asset, like in, in our eyes, we actually view that the same way. Like I don't necessarily view this as an investable asset. I view this as a speculative asset uh, and one that that uh, can be used to generate uh, meaningful return based on uh, on speculation and on trading. But in in terms of of believing that this will be it forever, 
like that feels a bit disingenuous to me. So uh, we, we uh, and that's a big part of our business, right? Our entire business is based on this thought that uh, that no single asset in this asset class uh, will, will sort of be the, the predominant asset that always exists and that there's opportunity to, to outperform the broader market um, with active management. Uh, yeah, and I mean, yeah, with that, so, uh, go ahead, Alex, go, go for yeah, it. Yeah, so just to continue the, the conversation, the, the, um, I, I see three use cases today, right? So like uh, Miko said, uh, doomsday insurance or um, the hedging or diversification that you need in your, in your wallet or in your, in your asset base uh, for anyone, right? The, when you see what the Fed is doing and the Fed printed more money in three months than it did in a hundred years. So if you're not afraid of that, then you just don't understand anything, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so that the basement of our earnings uh, is, is basically unfair uh, distribution of the wealth in this country because uh, this, whatever, six, seven trillion dollars that is hitting the economy is going, the people that benefit from that six, seven trillion are the first few people who touch that money. By the time that money trickles to the person who's buying his groceries, uh, everybody got already diluted by 30, 40, 50%, right? So, so only the first person or the second person uh, seeing that money going through their uh, system uh, is benefiting because the dilution hasn't really hit everybody. So, uh, so when people are going to see that their uh, milk now costs 50% more and their internet access costs 50% more and everything becomes more expensive, but their income stayed the same. Actually, the income is the same since 1970, unless they're in computing or in finance. And what you're going to have is what you have here in Manhattan, riots in the streets, where they basically, uh, all of Madison Avenue is boarded up. It looks like a third world country after, uh, you know. So, so, so my point is, is that the, the, the economic system we live in does not work for 99% of Americans. And we're all pretending we are part of the 1%. We're pretending like everything is wonderful. You know, we, we don't feel any pain. What are you guys talking about? So the idea that the dollar is a stable currency, that the U.S. economy is a stable economy, is just is is just crazy. You know, we we owe more money to more countries than anyone in history, and we're piling up on that debt faster than anyone in history. So, so so Bitcoin is a solution for store of value. The second the second use case that that is working exceptionally well is uh, USDT or Tether in combination with Ethereum. It, is, uh, it has higher fungibility than any currency on the planet, meaning it's, it's actually moving through the system 24-7, 365. It hasn't had one minute of downtime and uh, it's performing its function of, of, of uh, delivering payments to, to millions of users around the world, right? And the third use case which uh, Celsius originated was basically simple interest income. So we have 26 uh, items in the wallet and you can earn interest. You, you believe in fiat, great. We have 11 fiat currencies that you can earn uh, up to 100 times more than your bank, right? So uh, you love Bitcoin, great. We'll pay you three or 4% on Bitcoin. You like Ethereum, we'll pay you on Ethereum, right? So, so the idea that these things can yield and now we actually have gold as well. So you can earn, yield 3% on gold uh, these are things that, that, that you cannot get from the traditional banking system or central bank system, which is going to zero or negative. So these three utilities are, are almost like the foundations of finance. If you have those three and they're really robust and scalable and so on, you're going to have hundreds of millions, if not billions of people join. Now, the reason they're not joining is because they don't trust the system. The system is full of hackers and scammers and and projects that are just here uh, to, to grab your money and run away. And, and you know, and it kind of looks at like the eight, late 1800s in the United States where everybody could open a bank and close it two days later and run away with the money. That's where we are effectively with, with crypto. So when few uh, trustworthy institutions emerge out of this, uh, all of this noise, uh, you're going to see uh, all the money in the world migrate from traditional finance where basically it cannot find any yield and it's all up to speculators to squeeze a little bit from here and there 
to something that is completely detached from uh, the fiat infrastructure that we, we all rely on every day. Yeah, I mean, this I was mentioned pre-show. We uh, was on a panel yesterday with uh, with Joe Lubin, and uh, he went from the the word uh, not millions or billions, but past trillions, and went to quadrillions. That you know the the idea of decentralized finance, kind of where we're headed towards in this conversation right now, has that has that potential, right? You move all of that onto a system of this nature. I mean, that number just continues to get infinite uh, as we go. Um, as well, but Miko, I feel like you have a point uh, that you want to add on to that. You see the big smiles. You had the little fire going in the background. Uh, That's right. Everything That's right. was burning. So go for absolutely, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, the fire that I was kind of igniting is really related to what Alex was saying about the kind of broader economy and how it's not functional, uh, you know, for so many people uh, today. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, it's for sure not working for uh, the vast, vast majority of people. Uh, you know, and, and that's what protests are about. But, uh, you know, I think for for just to augment what Alex is saying, you know, a full dis disclosure, I'm a, you know, long time <clears throat> Celsius advisor. But, you know, I think that whether it be kind of uh, DeFi or more centralized, you know, I think Alex actually hit the key uh, button, which is really related to trust, right? And I think that the idea of trusted institutions kind of emerging out of this, you know, and I think interest in, is absolutely a killer application. And it's a deeply compelling killer application, especially given the macro, which is, in a way, like, what we've been seeing is this sort of uh, what people call the TINA economy, right? And TINA stands for there is no alternative, right? But the thing that I think is that's that's actually not the case, right? There there is an alternative. It's just that um, what's happening is is that you know it, it's it's precarious. Like I used to have this description of a man in a high place standing on two there's there's two metal beams, but the beam that he's standing on is actually known to collapse, right? And that's the existing financial infrastructure. So the question becomes, what is the behavior associated with the unknown beam that this funny trickster Satoshi has put up next to him, right? So the behavior is shifting the weight onto the new beam, which kind of comes in and out of it, right? The pressure, you know, it's sort of shifting the weight because, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, the beam that we're standing on is known to collapse, right? And, you know, if you're looking at, the, you know, the Dow Jones industrial average, um, you can't be feeling super comfortable that twenty five thousand is good pricing. I mean that that you know I I think uh, we have riots in the street, right? We have four, forty million people out of work, and yet the stock market's back to where it was. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, people people who are watching the Dow are are you know they're really kind of in the mood of uh, you know this is fine, right? Like you know I I just have to say like it's not. Uh, it's not really appropriate to think that. So to me, you know, that relates to the core thesis that we're describing, which is that, you know, is this kind of the, the turning point or existential moment for this kind of alternative asset class? And I think that it does have to do with reliability, trustworthiness, institution, you know, and I think kind of to sort of counterpoint a little bit about what Joe Lubin was saying about DeFi, like, I feel like DeFi, CeFi is like a really unrealistic oppositional paradigm, you know, and I, what I want to say about it is, is that one of the biggest problems with DeFi is just this oracles problem, right? So uh, to me, when you look at decentralized exchange or DEX, one of the things that remains unsolved that's fundamental is how do you decentralize an order book without promoting uh, front running from, from miners? Right. So, uh, you know, so far, people haven't been able to solve that very well. Second question, how do DeFi people decentralize oracles without incentivizing things like the maker DDoS attack? Right. So my point is, is that it's not about centralized or decentralized as some kind of religious uh, experience because you can you can just centralize an oracle. Right. And if you centralize the oracle then you have what the financial industry has been relying on for like, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is, um, 
you know, it, it shouldn't be this religious DeFi, CeFi thing. It should be about trust, right? Because that's what this game has been about. And, you know, to me, like, I, I feel like that's that's kind of where my head's at with this thing. Uh, but, you know, okay. I, I, so Dick, j- jump in, jump in. I mean, I got, yeah, I got so, a lot so more ranting to do, but, uh, you know, that's, that's I, just I, my- I 100% rant. agree in this, in this argument of trust, um, yet we're using the word trust and USDT in the same sentence. And yes. I just, I, I want to kind of circle back deserves on that, right? one of these. So, so here we are. Um, and Alex is right. Like USDT is one of the, the, I mean, it's got the what second or third, third largest market cap now um, in, in this asset class, there are billions of dollars uh, purported to, to be running on, on USDT. Um, yet it's, it's an asset class that has been mired in controversy over the last five years. Uh, and it's it's one where effectively uh, it's impossible for a retail user to actually redeem and get their their U.S. dollars back, uh, and it's one where the the stability is questionable. Um, the, there is volatility in the price, uh, and it's one where the the asset backing has been proven to not actually be one to one. We've seen that in in court documents. It's dropped as low as seventy five percent. So. Uh, but it, it is an asset that sort of makes so much of the world of this of this ecosystem function. Uh, without USDT, so, sort of a lot of what we've we've we all do on a day to day basis goes away, um, and it is being used for payments. Like I think that is an interesting piece. So effectively, you've got market participants who, instead of trusting that the U.S. dollar will sort of exist. Uh, uh, and that the U.S. dollar will be backed by the government are trusting that sort of tether will, will continue to exist. And despite knowing that it's not actually backed by anything, um, they, they have formed this this level of trust that makes them comfortable with with it as a payments mechanism. Like that, that's a, a conundrum that has been confusing to me for for quite some time as a market participant in this this space, and uh, particularly due to the fact that it's such an important part. So I think that's, it's an, it, worthwhile to talk about that in a little bit more depth uh, if, if we're gonna talk about trust. Sure, I'm happy, happy to talk about it. Look, today um, um, USDT with $9 billion worth of issuance uh, is 10 times more than all the other stable coins put together. You take USDC plus Paxos plus anyone, take all the ones that exist across the planet including any government stable coin, including Venezuela, including everybody else. And it has 10 times more than all the other guys put together. So there's a reason for that, right? And um, the 75% snapshot you're talking about is one second in the history of Bitcoin, of uh, USDT, where the US government, if you know, throws $800 million worth of USDT's money and then looked at how much is left in the account and said, oh, you have 75 cents. Well, they are the ones who are freezing $800 million, which is the rest of the money. So USDT, um, not that I'm not here to defend USDT. I'm just talking about the facts that are all available to anyone who actually read all of the arguments, right? So mm-hmm. back and forth. The, the, but, but, uh, so just on that point, like that's a, it's a, that's a fascinating point, right? Here's an asset that is purported to have $9 billion, but that the US government could come in and freeze a giant portion of its, its backing. No, like, they froze, uh, no, what, they, what the US government, the US government did not freeze USDT or Tether. What US government did is it, it, it froze a company that was an agent for Tether that did all right, of yeah, the- if, It froze under, the underlying assets. No, no. The, yeah. Tether used a, a company in Panama to issue the dollar settlements on its behalf. The company in Panama re- misrepresented uh, the, some of the wire transfers. And as you know, when you, when you misrepresent either the originating party or the destination party, you're violating the, the banking act. So because of that, uh, uh, both the US government and um, other jurisdictions had a case, a valid case to freeze these assets because the transfer of money was, uh, could be conceived as money laundering. Okay, so all of that, I'm not here sitting arguing that the government did anything illegal, the opposite. The government did what it was supposed to do. And at that moment, uh, Tether got caught with having less on deposits uh, than it had in issued Tether. Okay, and that was when they had, uh, I think, less than a billion dollars 
in total issuance. It wasn't like, this is not now. Today they have more than $9 billion in, uh, in the bank on $9 billion worth of Tether circulating, right? So there, I don't think anyone is arguing that this second, especially when they're under full investigation of the attorney general, that they, are, they don't have the assets, right? Are you arguing that they don't have the assets today? I, I'm not making that argument. I'm just saying that there is no way to know that. There's no, no there transparency. Is. There is transparency. You, you can go to their website. It's usdt.to. And they yeah, but Alex, I can make a website that says I have $9 billion of cash in my bank and, and put that on a web page as well. Like, a bank, a chartered bank, a chartered bank that has a corresponding relationship with Citibank. So if you were just making up statements, Citibank would not be your corresponding bank. But there's a, there's a balance sheet and a statement from the bank saying, here's how much we have on deposit from Tether. So my point is, is that, you know, like I, I'm not saying that they are the cleanest or the best company in crypto. My point is, mm -hmm. is that, that when we have a success story, uh, instead of the community pulling together and helping it, uh, we're poking it in the eye and what's the replacement? Let, let me ask you a question. What, how much in deposits or in actual assets is behind a hundred dollar bill? A, a physical bill of a hundred dollars. If I go in, I want to redeem it against something. What am I going to get against that? Nothing. Like that's that was my point earlier. Exactly. It's like we we've taken sort of this U.S. dollar that's not backed, exactly. and we've created. So we agree. Both of us yeah. agree that 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 the replacement, like Miko was saying, the replacement for uh, uh, for the U.S. dollar uh, is non-existent, right? So so the, so we have to convince people that. The system that we're building um, uh, is the replacement for the entire financial system. Because, you know, again, look, I was born in uh, in, in communism in, in U the USSR, and you know, I grew up in socialism in Israel. I, I spent 30 years in the United States, and I can tell you, neither one of those three systems work. It's not like just capitalism doesn't work for Americans. It's socialism doesn't work in Europe. Look at the mess they have, and look at look at Russia and China and so on, right? So. So the, for me, what we're trying to create with DeFi, what we're trying to create with decentralization is the fourth system. It's not just, it's a, it's a completely different hierarchical society that, that, that relies on people's contribution to society instead of people's ability to make money. Today, who do we compensate? Who are our heroes? Warren Buffett, people that, that can extract, allocate capital and extract as much as possible out of society. Now, Let's look at Warren Buffett's number one source of income, okay? It's his dividends from, from the many, many banks that he invested in. Now, but the banks last year made $30 billion just from charging overdraft to the poorest American, 30 billion. Then, then they charge, the, everything is just fees. It's fees on fees on fees from the poorest American. I'm a rich guy. None of the banks charge me any fees. I've never paid a single fee to any bank because if they do, I'm just gonna take my money and move somewhere else. I don't, I don't pay banking, uh, uh, checking fees or transfer fees, any fees, right? Because they have millions of dollars on deposit with every one of them. So, so my point is, is that, that all that profit is generated from the poor. It's not generated from the rich. And, 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 and in that system, all we're doing is propagating the, the, the imba imbalance and, and the lack of, of the ability of people to move up the, the, in the social hierarchy uh, forever, right? So, so if we're going to build a new system, I'm saying all these things because I'm saying that if we're going to build a new system, and uh, to to back to Miko's point, uh, DeFi has to act in the best interest of the depositor and not of the shareholder, and that's what we're not doing, right? If you look at DeFi or you look at a lot of the products that are generated, most of what the crypto community has done is a copy of Wall Street. It's a copy of the existing world. It's not looking at at the blockchain or decentralization saying, here's our opportunity to redesign, redefine society. And we're going to build new institutions, the new house on the top of the hill, which is why I came to America, right? This was a shiny house at the top of the hill. Now we have to build a new one on the decentralized hill that, and we got to bring the 350 million Americans to that hill because the hill they're on, they're never going to climb to the top of the hill. They're always going to stay at the bottom of that hill. So from the from the technology, just to bring us on track because we've got a little bit of time left here. So 
it was a great, great point in leading into the, the one of the big questions I wanted to ask is from a technology and infrastructure standpoint, um, what needs still to be added to all of this so, um, <laughs> over the coming you know year to the next couple of years, uh, really to to not just help this move from uh, to Alex, to your point, you know, kind of a, a replication of Wall Street today, but to that new shiny decentralized home up on the next hill. Like, what do we need to add? What pieces are missing? Um, and Miko, I know you wanted to touch on this, but I would love to get everyone's opinion as well. So great points. Yeah, I mean, my my thing is this is I think one of the really big pieces that we need is better kind of user experiences on top. So, you know, that's, we're pretty passionate about that at Evercoin. Uh, you know, I think self-custody, uh, that's a big topic. So that infrastructure needs to be built. Uh, you know, so I think that's a big deal, right? And, and what that to me represents is neobanking, which is a class of financial organization that's really good at building apps and user acquisition. So I feel like uh, Celsius is a good example of that kind of organization as well, uh, you know. And I think that really, you know, those things are are super essential to be built. Uh, you know, I think the thing that uh, is 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 really important to understand, I think, though, is that we do have a pretty big base of capability. You know, the thing that I think is missing in large part is that, you know, we're really missing a lot of fairly positive user experiences. I think that, you know, there's there's very few really strong user experiences that you can have in this space. And there's a bunch of negative user experiences that you can have. Uh, so, you know, I, I feel like we need to do better there. Right. I don't want to, that's, wanna, that's an issue plug. across the board. It's an issue across the board. Like if you look at the, the landscape of funds in this space, like most of the funds that we know are managing their portfolios with spreadsheets. Like that's, it's embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, the tools, the tools here are, absurd and obtuse and they don't interact well they're expensive um, and it's been that way since we started in in 2018 uh, you know we we ended up building an entire platform uh for our fund to operate to solve these these problems uh, it, it it's a shame that sort of each and every fund has to go do that um, or use their spreadsheets like uh across the board, this, this user experience issue, these tool sets, uh, they could, they continue to be a challenge. They're definitely getting better. And um, I think, uh, but it's, it's sort of a slow improvement, right? It's not, if we, if we are going to make the argument that sort of this new wave of capital is going to come and, and sort of save the, the industry, which, which Alex was kind of highlighting earlier, we need these new users. Uh, we need to make sort of a, a, step forward improvement to these tools, not these these incremental improvements that, that have occurred over the last two and a half years. Yeah, look, I, I agree with everything Jesse and uh, Miko said. I, I think just to illustrate something, I think it's an important thing just to get to the weeds a little bit. Uh, when the internet was born and, and it was just a, net, a new network, a TCPIP network of whatever, eight or nine universities, it wasn't connected to anything else. It was this new network that operated on its own and people could just send messages to each other and then email and then slowly it got open. You know, I'm talking about the seventies and eighties, right? Then in the nineties, it opened up and we built all kinds of other stuff on it. Then, and we're kind of like in the same place with the blockchain. Most people don't understand that the blockchain is its own network. It's not part of the internet. Most people, if you ask them, what is a blockchain? They say, oh, this, it's like this internet thing that runs uh, blocks. No, it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> can't take any information from the internet and put it on the blockchain. That's why you need oracles like Miko was saying. Yes, so, oracles. Yes. So, so, so we, we, the, the challenge with the building a whole new network from scratch, because we realize the limitations of the, uh, you know, time division uh, network and the TCP IP network and, and so on is, is that uh, we don't have anything, right? We, we're building the infrastructure from scratch. And, and the challenges that we're having is that everything we need has to be built from scratch. You want to manage a fund? Guess what? You can't manage anything because you can't take anything from the old world and transport it, right? So running it on a spreadsheet is better than using any software that existed in the last hundred years on Wall Street, right? So, so the, the challenges are, are tremendous and that's why you're seeing a lot of hacks and that's why you're seeing a lot of uh, kind of and we have to sometimes take a step back before we take a step forward, right? Because we're still at the very, very early days and there's nothing wrong with it. Like, 
You know how many hacks we found in the TCP IP protocols and in the encryption and in the, all the, everything that we ever did on the internet uh, got hacked a million times. Look how many patches Microsoft has, right? I mean, thousands and thousands of patches, right? <laughs> so, so I don't see that as, as a limitation. I see that as just uh, want- <clears throat> and the, the, the critical things for me are what's the size of the community and are we acting in their best interest? And, and, I, and the- I, I- yeah, just to finish, just one punchline. The, the go, beef go I it. have with the community is that most of the players here are short-term thinkers that are just here to extract some value and go back to the old world. And you're not going to build a new America if you're all you're doing is thinking, oh, I'm just going to take cotton and bring it back to the UK. And then I'm going to make a lot of money and buy myself a nice house in the UK because that's what we are. We're like thinking like that. Yeah, I want to talk about that, and I want to make the counterpoint to the core thesis of the whole uh, discussion we're having about this being kind of a make or break moment. I feel like Bitcoin has been declared dead like maybe fifty times in its history, and you know it, it may it may uh, you know I'm not a price prediction guy, so it may revisit three thousand, two thousand, one thousand, but like you know, and it will be declared dead many times on the in the journey. And I do think that kind of volatility is definitely enough to make anyone seasick. But to be perfectly honest, the idea that it could be made or broken, it's really not that meaningful. And the reason why I don't think it's that meaningful is, is that my lens is I've been here in Silicon Valley for, you know, 30 years looking at open source software. <clears throat> and open source software has basically like utterly dominated every meaningful niche of software. And the entire proprietary software business is actually worth more than it's ever been worth before. And all the proprietary software companies are built on top of open source software, right? So my point is, is that open source financial infrastructure is inevitable and that there will only be organizations that benefit from the existence of that because it lowers the cost of the infrastructure, right? So, so you know, whether it be JP Morgan opening their accounts for Binance and Coinbase, or, you know, whether it be JPM coin or yeah, Goldman Sachs is probably out, but like, you know, there, there, there will be beneficiaries, right? So that everyone's going to benefit from open source because it lowers the cost, right? So people who are like, oh, I don't like lower cost infrastructure, like good luck with that business model. Like you're, you're not going to win, right? So the point is, is that people who are complaining, oh, well, the software has bugs or, oh, the software doesn't have the features I want. You know, my argument to you is just wait. Like this is open source software. Like just wait. Like it, all the features will be there. You know, all the bugs will be removed because that's what open source software has always done. It's always marched forward day by day with pull requests. And there's just thousands of pull requests, thousands of Bitcoin improvement projects and, you know, uh, Ethereum improvement. Like every single chain is improving bit by bit and some of them will die and some of them won't but like you know I, it's inevitable so the idea that it could break now and be dead is is it's nonsensical like i think it's it's inevitable that open source financial infrastructure is going to take over the timing is uncertain that's my that's my you know one one other really interesting piece here that i think has hindered a lot of of uh innovation in the space is the regulatory landscape that we all operate in right so because we're dealing with money and because uh, because there is such a regulatory overhead on, on any company that deals with money, that has become such a big hurdle uh, for folks trying to, d- to do anything. So you look at the custodians in the space, you know, they have been dragged down trying to deal with the, the qualified custodian laws or the trust laws. You look at, uh, you look at the funds in the space, you look at and sort of any any technology, anytime you even stable coins, right? You, anybody can have a great idea, and they're like, "Oh, this isn't going to be that hard to go implement. I can build the technology in weeks, months, years, whatever it is." And then they go look at the regulatory requirements to, to launch that technology or um, to get the licensing they need, uh, and it's a ridiculous brick wall. Uh, and that's been a big challenge for for so many folks entering the space. No, you're you're 100 right, and we're heading in the wrong direction. Like in '96, uh, there was a very important law that was passed that basically guaranteed that there's not going to be taxation or regulation of the internet. And that's what allowed that Cambrian explosion. And what we're facing now is the opposite because of scams, because of all the bad actors. So we're, we're definitely picking the, you know, we, we're f- facing a fork in the road and we're picking the wrong, the wrong uh, turn here. But uh, 
Uh, I think I agree with Miko that I think this, the open source will prevail. And, and one of the main arguments uh, that I have is that if you look at almost every vertical of our economy, you will see that something came and, and basically took out all the toll collectors, took out all of the cost by 90%. And, and the yeah. only area that it has not happened uh, was FinTech, right? I mean, FinTech had zero impact on the opposite. The banks, most of the banks are more profitable because of FinTech. FinTech has not put a scratch on Citibank or on JP Morgan or Bank of America, not even a scratch. And 30 years of, and hundreds of billions of dollars deployed by VCs, right? And because it's because all of the piping and all the infrastructure stayed exactly the same, right? So today, uh, most of the banking infrastructure or them sitting in the middle of the toll collector represents about two and a half percent of the world's economy is just going to these guys that sit in the middle and just make sure that stuff moves from here to there. And, and Visa Masco is just over three percent, right? So, so all of that is going to be shrunk by an order of magnitude by the blockchain. And the question is, is it going to happen now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, right? And, and I've said this several times, I'm not arguing that Bitcoin is gonna be the, the, the blockchain that wins that. We may need a whole new blockchain that learns all the lessons from the first five or six blockchains and delivers uh, that winning thing. Like, again, look, I wrote the protocol for voice over IP and I did not build the winning company. I had a great company, it was worth 2 billion, whatever. But uh, WhatsApp came 15 years after I invented voice over IP and delivered the winning uh, formula by not charging a single dollar to anybody and selling to Facebook for 22 billion, right? So, so the, the, the financial model is not always tied to what is the infrastructure, what is the technology, just like Miko was saying about open source not having almost any revenues, but uh, companies running on open source can be sold like and uh, for 40, 50 billion dollars, like uh, what's her name got sold to IBM, right? Uh, uh, what's her name? Gosh, the guys who manage Linux. Uh, anyway, Red Hat. What? Yeah. Red, so, Hat. Red Hat. Yeah. Red Hat. Red yeah, Hat. So, so, Jesse, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the same thing is going to happen here. I think the companies that can deliver value on top of the blockchain, right, are going mm -hmm. to be the one that's going to create the value. But it doesn't mean that we need a proprietary system. We can run an open platform, open standards, open ledger, uh, blockchains. Because if we don't do that, then the winners are gonna be a centralized version from the Chinese government or a centralized version from Facebook. And, and, and we definitely, I don't think anyone on this panel wants that to happen. No, and guys, we're, that, we're about that... at, so Jesse, let me just say this, we're about out of time. So, so Jesse's answer and then closing thoughts. So Jesse, you get two, two things to say here. Um, and then we'll we'll wrap up. So I apologize for for interrupting, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I think the issue with with sort of treating blockchain, treating this industry like we treat open source software, is that mistakes result in people losing capital, and you see that in the DeFi space on a regular basis. Uh, and it's it is part of sort of the innovation cycle. And early adopters need to understand what's at risk is they put assets into DeFi. Uh, but, it, but that's the, that's the biggest issue, right? There are bugs in every piece of code ever published. Most of them don't result in irrecoverable loss of capital for, for users. Uh, and so that like, that's a challenge of dealing with, with this industry. That's a challenge of writing code in this industry. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything is under constant attack. So, uh, Something to something to think about, and not even constant attack, just constant change, right? There's 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 constantly something new to add in, in every moment. So, but I think, uh, I, think <clears throat> I just want to retort and say like I'm, we're okay with that. And what I mean by we're okay with that is is that you know if you look at things like Ethereum improvement, a lot of people have complained about it, and they're saying, oh, it's really slow. Right. But like if you think about the speed of the rate of change of the improvement of banking software, let's say, for example, Swift, like how much has Swift changed? Uh, see, I got a smile out of Alex. Right. So it's like, why? Because of the attacks. Right. So the point is, is that, you know, yes, bad things happen and it collapses. But the thing that's fundamental is if you study the complexity theory research of Per Bach, 
uh, you know, self-organized criticality, what you understand is complex systems all have the property of collapse and that they intrinsically collapse. So the fact that, that DeFi collapses, you know, is it's DeFi is not supposed to protect you from collapses, but neither is CeFi, right? So like these, all these systems are known to collapse. The question really becomes about the freedom to choose your paradigm of governance Right. And what I'm saying is, is that it isn't about a monolithic governance like, you know, Bitcoin is an open source governance. So we could choose that. But it, maybe it isn't Bitcoin. Right. But the point is, is if you have thousands of choices, then people can kind of freely elect what they do based on their consent. So I think that's the open source model. And, you know, that's I think that's where this thing has to go. Closing thoughts, Alex. <laughs> so look, this panel was was about is this are the star, all the stars aligned? Uh, uh, is this the moment of takeoff uh, for Bitcoin? And it should be right. I mean, uh, uh, from a monetary standpoint, from uh, what's happening, uh, you know, in, in the social unrest, uh, the coronavirus, right? All of the stress is, is should indicate that you should park your assets in non-correlated. Uh, non-fiat correlated uh, uh, possibilities, and you know, my my argument to people is that your 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 house, your income, your your bonds, your stock, everything you have, your future income, is is all dollar denominated. So so you should take twenty five percent of your assets and put in something that is not, and and you should really have a lot of gold, and you should have a lot of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies because these are the only two things that kind of. Are, are not attached to that, uh, to that uh, galaxy that we live in, right? So, so, so yes, the stars are aligned, but there is a lot of friction going forward because uh, a lot of people don't believe in it. And a lot of people look at, the, what, at uh, what we're trying to do and say, hey, this is easy profits. I can just short this thing and it will be worth zero. So all I have to do is find, let it come up a little bit and I'm gonna short it, right? And, and so we need to break through these levels, the 10,000, 12,000, 14,000 are the, like the three levels that I think we're gonna have a lot of resistance, but between 14,000 and 20,000, there's a lot of room. And then we're gonna have resistance at new highs, right? All the people who bought it close to new highs are gonna be selling at those levels. So when we break through that, there's gonna be a lot of people joining. So, so yes, it is, but it's gonna take until the end of the year, beginning of next year for us to see new highs. Wonderful. And Alex, where can everyone find you as we, we close up here? Where can everyone go to find you in Celsius? Yeah, my, my email is alex at mashinsky.com. My last name, uh, celsius.network, Celsius Network on Telegram on, on Twitter, and uh, Mashinsky, at Mashinsky on uh, Twitter. So whatever you prefer, uh, come and join us. Wonderful. Jesse, where can yeah, everyone you find can you? Find, find more about uh, Strix Leviathan and, and our Octopus platform at Strix, S-T-R-I-X, fund, F-U-N-D dot com. And I'm on Twitter at Jesse Proudman. And Miko. Yeah, uh, I think you can find everything on Miko.com, M-I-K-O dot com, my website. You can find my Twitters there. You can find everything. So. Uh, and you have another website. What's the other one? Safer... Oh, it's called, it's called safercrypto.org. And that, that site is more dedicated for just tips and tricks on how to how to practice safe crypto and how to secure all of your assets and you know make sure <laughs> i wanted to make sure after this discussion you got a chance to plug that but uh gentlemen thank you very much alex jesse miko thank you so much for continuing the conversation from last week going a few levels deeper and to your audience for joining us on this issue this edition of vc tv uh, i hope you learned a little bit more and each of our speakers as they've said are available on on social and all other mediums of your choosing. Uh, Jesse dropped a, a great article uh, in the chat, which I will share with everyone uh, as we wrap up today. Uh, I'll find Alex's article and uh, safeforcrypto.com and make sure those get into the comments so that each of you can get a chance to dive in uh, another layer uh, deeper. So with that, gentlemen, thank you very much. As you heard it here on BCTV, this was the make or break uh, discussion about digital assets as we go forward. So. Thank you guys. Have Thanks. a great day. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everyone. You three okay, can drop off, see, Jim. Great to see you. Oh all. yeah, you too. And and Jim, you're you're up. Uh, so we're gonna let these guys drop, unless they want to hang out. I mean, Jesse's might just chill with us. Nope. All right, he's gone. Jim, welcome. Um, so much. We'll we'll. Uh,
take a quick breath. <laughs> okay. um, there we go. Uh, again, hi, everybody. I'm Kyle Lacan. I'm your host uh, on another episode of VCTV. And another shout out to Elena and the LA Token team for making all of this uh, possible every day, all day, uh, 24-7. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be, be joined here by uh, another uh, speaker and uh, astound professor. Uh, Jim, welcome to the show. Ha pleasure to have you. And uh, Jim today will be sharing a, a keynote discussion. Uh, so you'll be hearing a lot from him. And Jim, we did run over a few minutes, so feel free as well. We'll, we'll go, go a few minutes over. But uh, Jim's, Jim's talk today follows our, our last panel discussion and that from earlier in the week of, of disrupting finance, uh, right? How, uh, how to upend the, the traditional Wall Street uh, model uh, leveraging FinTech. And I think, again, that's a perfect topic to transition into uh, with the last conversation we just had and the continued uh, discussions that are happening off camera uh, right now in the general markets. And so, Jim, you're, you're the founder and CEO of SOCAT. You're an associate professor in finance at John Hopkins uh, a School of Business. I don't want to take any much more time. I want to turn it over to you. Uh, this is your time, and we're excited to hear what you have to say and where we're going. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kyle. And I really appreciate um, LA Token or Liquid uh, Asset Exchange for allowing me to come over here and sort of share my thoughts. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but Johns Hopkins started its first blockchain course that I taught <laughs> in 2018. At the time when I proposed the course, I wanted to call it uh, Bitcoins, Cryptocurrencies, and Blockchain. So in 2018, I got yelled at. <laughs> and so you know, we had to, we had to uh, take away a couple of those words and we just called it blockchain. And so we, call it, we had the first blockchain course. Um, and, you know, students loved it, obviously. They're so excited about it. And then recently we got to put back in cryptocurrencies. So now it's called cryptocurrencies and blockchains. And slowly, you know, hopefully we'll bring in the Bitcoin name uh, into that <laughs> course. But, you know, the excitement at the um, MBA level and the master level is just, just, you know, you can tell this thing is going to um, just tide away pretty soon, right? So I think, you know, one warning here is usually uh, people who are smart are a little bit early. <laughs> so, so people, you know, that I meet in the community, super duper smart, super talented, you know, you had three of the top, you know, thought leaders there. Um, are we early? That's the question that, you know, I keep asking. Also, when I was listening to that discussion, the other thing that sort of comes into mind was the conversations about regulations. And, you know, imagine the following that uh, the regulators down in DC, I, I'm outside of Baltimore. So, you know, I'm pretty close to the regulators. Imagine if they said, hey, game on, we're not going to, you know, as long as you tell us who you are and you try to play by the rules, uh, you can do whatever you want in the blockchain space and you can launch these coins. I mean, I think that would be a tidal wave of um, economic development and excitement and startup. So, I mean, I think people are sitting on this a little bit on the sidelines and they're not um, engaging because there's still some regulatory uncertainty about this. Right. And there's reasons why and so forth. But you know, I think the vast majority of people that I've met, especially students around the area, Johns Hopkins and also down in DC and even startups, you know, 100% legit. Um, they're trying, sincerely trying to, you know, create jobs and, you know, use the uh, technology, the internet and blockchains to um, do good. And we're seeing more and more of that take up inside the government, which is really, really interesting. Um, understanding, you know, about um, drugs and foods and origins and so forth. It's, it's a very exciting industry. Um, my only question is, are we early, right? Or, you know, are we too early on this? But, um, you know, with that, what I want to do just really briefly here is um, just introduce the company SoCat. This is named after my two daughters, Sophie and Catherine. And they, they come into this story because you'll see that um, my story and my journey is coming from uh, the point of view of a father. Um, and I'm trying to think about um, what kind of investments are good for my daughters. <laughs> and my daughters are age 11 and 14, right? So I was talking to um, um, Catherine and I said, hey, you know, I'm trying to figure out a good investment, you know, so you, you can pull out when you're 65, right? So I got like a 50 year window and what can I create for you? I teach the wealth management course. I've, I've seen, I've taught a lot of finance courses in my career here. I've been at Johns Hopkins like eight years, right? 
So I, I've seen, um, you know, finance innovations. I've seen how slow the market moves. Uh, prior to teaching, I worked at some hedge funds and also on Wall Street. So, you know, I, I've sort of seen a lot of things. And I want to share my story and I want to engage everyone and challenge people um, because I think this is an interesting way to go. But, um, um, you know, as I gather more information and feedback, um, you know, the, the business model may adjust. But I want to go through that. So what I'm going to do now is share my screen. And feel, Kyle, feel free to jump in anytime that you want to. If something's Perfect. not clear, I'd love to get your feedback too, because I know you yeah, absolutely. see a lot of these, right? So this is yeah. uh, SoCat's Credit Innovation. Um, the company SoCat is uh, Sophie and uh, K for Catherine. And you know there's supposed to be an S there and a K, <laughs> if you can see it. Um, the setup is very simple. Um, I'm a finance professor and I think about investments all day long and I think about how to teach these concepts effectively to students, right? And I try to think, you know, what would I wanna know when I was an MBA student, right? And what is useful in the industry because I worked in the industry, right? But in particular, let's think about investments for a very long horizon, right? I think, you know, when we were on Wall Street, when I was on Wall Street, we care very much about, you know, um, making p &L and sort of, we were very focused on, you know, quarterly earnings or, you know, what, how did you perform within the year, right? Our, our horizons were very sort of short. When I was at the hedge fund, if you don't have good performance in a year, then, you know, investors are gonna redeem. So, you know, the, the focus is just like right now. And I think what happens when you do that is that um, you don't really think about a long-term strategy, right? And so what I'm trying to in introduce here is a sort of rethink and reimagine sort of the things that we're, we're teaching students in classes, but also what's optimal for my daughters. And I think it can also be optimal for other parents or investors who have a longer term horizon. Um, so what we know, um, unfortunately, is that this trust between Wall Street and Main Street is broken, right? So the next generation, they've seen Wall Street. We, we have an article here, it says a lawsuit claims 10 big banks rigged the market for odd lots of US corporate bonds. So corporate bonds is a fascinating place. We're gonna discuss that. And in particular, this innovation has to do with corporate bonds. But um, what, what is interesting here, and I can understand why this happens, right? Um, you know, they're smart people on Wall Street. They're trying to, you know, move up in the world. They're trying to get bigger bonuses and propel their careers. They've been trained at some of the best business schools, you know, you can name them. And they're type A personalities. They work really hard. However, you know, um, in a, a marketplace like corporate bonds, you know, why is this so pervasive across all banks, right? It's not specific to one bank. It's across all the banks. So this is one of the things that I think, it, you know, um, we have to sort of, uh, be careful on in regards to trusting too much the banks. You know that's why we have the regulators there and so forth. But um, stuff like this has has happened before. We've seen um, issues with um, odd lot trading for stocks before. We're seeing something similar in the corporate bond world. And I, I want to sort of have people think about the parallels between the equity market and the fixed income market, in particular on the, the corporate bond side. So, um, you know, this is what we're trying to um, address. Um, one of the things is how big is this opportunity? So you always talk about total addressable market. The, according to the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association, corporate bonds uh, stands at $9.6 trillion. So this is a tremendously big market. The total fixed income market, as everyone sort of knows, is $45 trillion. And this is a very large market and um, a great opportunity for disruption. Um, Unfortunately, there's a problem here. And the problem is like trading corporate bonds is very difficult. So if I go to class and I ask my MBA students, how many of you guys can trade stocks? Everybody raises their hands. Professor Liu, that's no problem. You know, we got these accounts on Robinhood. We got Charles Schwab, Fidelity. And then I ask them, okay, okay, fine. You guys are smart kids. Um, do you know that these publicly traded corporations also issue um, debt and bonds? And they're like, yeah, 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 we know that. Of course we know that. That's the capital structure, right? And then I asked them, okay, <laughs> so how many of you have ever traded a corporate bond? Like from Apple, for example. And then it's silent. Nothing, right? Maybe there's somebody who worked in the fixed income market on Wall Street, just taking class. That person will raise their hand and say, oh, I traded those corporate bonds on this. Besides that person, nothing, right? And so... This is the problem that we're trying to directly address. 
And what you'll see is that when we solve this problem, because we're going to solve this problem, it unleashes a tremendous amount of uh, financial innovation. And I'll, show, I'll walk through some of the stuff that we are seeing. And then in particular, I'm going to focus on one thing that I think is really, really fascinating and interesting. And I'll try to um, sort of motivate it so that a lay person can understand it. You don't have to go to business school. And, you know, if your finance is a little bit rusty, that's, that's okay too. Um, so, you know, what, what, what's the nature of the problems? Well, you're dealing with a very antiquated marketplace. The pricing is very opaque, right? If I ask you to go get me uh, corporate bond prices, right? Historical daily prices for Apple, it'd be very difficult. Right? And why is that the case? Because Apple has many different issuances of these corporate bonds, right? Uh, also, there's, not, there's, a, there's some you know, um, activity on an electronic exchange, but not enough. A lot of this stuff trades OTC over the counter. And right now there's no one click solution. And so that's what we're trying to do here. We are trying to do the following and, and a lot of people may um, not have seen this picture before. There's two price theories here, okay? This is for Apple. And we, our first solution is providing price transparency. On the x-axis is years, uh, 2011, 2020. On the y-axis, the first one, which is green, is the stock price of Apple. That is available pretty much anyone who's a business school student or anyone who's trading knows how to get that daily prices. Open, high, low, close, adjust to close and volume. Now, what most people haven't seen ever <laughs> in their life, right? And this is what we're providing here, is this ability to see Apple's corporate bond price series, okay? And how do we create that, right? This information is publicly available, right? However, it's, you have to create a dynamic trading strategy because remember Apple is issuing corporate bonds, there's new issuances, there's coupon payments that are occurring semi-annually, there are bonds that are maturing, what happens when a bond matures, what do you do with the cash and so forth. So we created a this is basically what you would get, which is blue. If you invested in Apple's corporate bonds, the portfolio of their corporate bonds, and you're invested in the, those coupon payments, right? First observation, both the green line and the blue line are drifting positive in the positive direction. Remember, I'm thinking of a 50 year horizon, long term. I'm like, yeah, every year it may not have gone up, but over a long period of horizon, you know, that's what I'm interested in. First observation, there's a positive drift to both the equity and the bond, corporate bonds in Apple. Second observation, and this is very important, this is what we're going to uh, exploit a little bit later, is Apple's returns to their corporate bond portfolio is not perfectly correlated to an investment in Apple stock, okay? So a priori, if you ever been to business school, you're, you're, the alarm for diversification should be ringing in your head, hey, this is diversification. And, um, you know, for, the, for those who are in hedge funds, there's a guy named Ray Dalio at Bridgewater who exploited this idea of diversifications using tips. Now, tips are not that very interesting in regards to high expected returns, but the correlation structure is not, it's, it's not correlated to an institutional pension fund, right? So basically you lever up the tips and then it, it preserves the diversification benefits because as you're lever leveraging something, and what does that mean? That you just borrow money and you invest more. Um, the correlation structure doesn't change. Obviously, if you go overboard with leverage, then you expose yourself to other risks. But all I'm saying is that a little bit of leverage is okay and that you'll still retain the diversification ben benefits, but you'll also um, generate a higher expected return, assuming that the drift is higher than what you're borrowing at, right? So we're gonna actually use that same idea, but we're gonna do it at the individual company level and you'll see in a second. So the, the first thing is, um, um, so we have um, algorithms to pull out for any ticker, the corporate bond series. So now we can see the stock in the corporate bond series. What can we do with that? Well, you know, Robinhood allows you to um, purchase um, um, stocks and cryptos and options on the mobile phone. Uh, we could do the same thing, one ticker, one corporate on the mobile phone. I think that's the right mechanism in order to um, build a fintech sort of uh, innovative um, uh, company to get to the investors. And everybody wants to use their mobile phone for many, many, many things such as, you know, cryptocurrency trading and so forth. But we want to use that also for um, trading corporate bonds. Um, the other thing is, um, these are some of the um, buckets, but in particular, I want to concentrate on this long-term investing. Remember, I'm trying to formulate an uh, investment uh, plan for my daughters. I have a really long-term horizon, and um, I'm going to sort of use 
uh, both stocks and the corporate bonds for these um, companies in, in, in a way that I think is reasonable. And you know, there, there are obviously, you know, corporate bonds don't trade as liquid as stocks, but you know, nonetheless, I think if you have a long-term horizon and you, you take your time in order to put these positions on, I think you'll be fine. Other types of products is smart beta. So any equity smart beta products out there, you can create something very similar in the corporate bond land. Um, also ESG, there's a tremendous amount of um, interest in ESG. Uh, there's portfolios of stocks. You can actually analyze and see if they have those companies have corporate bonds and provide a similar portfolio uh, in the corporate bond space. I think that's gonna be a very interesting place to um, innovate and build products. Um, the team, as you'll see, I'll introduce a little bit later, you know, we're uh, academics uh, who've had uh, experience on Wall Street and, you know, we love to write research uh, reports. We love to analyze data and we like to um, sort of shake things up. Um, okay, so for everybody who's interested, this is all publicly available on LinkedIn. You can read the article. I just stepped through every one of those, one, two, three. It's called volatility adjusted 60-40. And why am I using that term 60-40? Because most people understand our institutional investors understand 60% in equity and 40% in bonds. It's just easy. Could you use, use risk parity? Absolutely. Could you do equally weighted? Absolutely. Mean variance, of course, no problem. I'm trying to generate some excitement, but also I want to be understood by everyone so they know, know exactly what's going on. So the idea here is very simple. Um, you could invest in 100% your money into Apple stock. Okay, That has a particular type of volatility. Now, suppose I gave you a 60-40 portfolio, 60% in Apple stock and 40% in Apple's corporate bonds. And now I took that portfolio and I leverage it out so it has the same volatility as your investment in Apple stock, 100%. What I'm saying is that might be a better investment over a long period of time. The key here is a long period of time. So any one year, <laughs> the 100% in, in Apple stock may be the 60 volatility is just of 60, 40, but I'm saying over a longer horizon, that's, that's the idea. Um, here's a, a, a three graphs and we'll be done here. Um, here is uh, Dow Jones 30 stocks. We pair off the stock uh, returns, monthly returns with the associated corporate bond portfolio returns for that particular ticker, for that particular company. And we just look at the correlation, this is monthly returns, and you can see the correlations are sort of around zero to 0.2. So instinctively you say, oh, this is pretty interesting because it seems like a lot of these companies, uh, when you look at their equities versus their corporate bond side is not perfectly correlated, that's right. The other question is how much volatility do you need in order to pull this off? Here is the um, levels of volatility adjustments. So $1, you need to put in 1.65. So you, you, for every $1 investment in order uh, for Apple um, stock at 100%, you need $1 and bar 60 cents and put it in the 60-40 portfolio to match the volatility, right? What's important is understanding the excess return over a long period of time. So these are annual excess returns, the histograms. Um, sort of around 100 basis points, 200 basis points, or one or two percent, right? Some some companies you get a little bit more, some companies you get a little bit less, right? Um, what is important here is to remember that we're charging for leverage, which is uh, um, one percent, 100 basis points, and also um, you have to take a little bit of time in order to put on these portfolios. So the transaction costs, you have to be careful. So if you can execute this uh, relatively in a clean way, obviously you're going to use ele electronic trading in order to do this then you probably be able to sort of pull out at least from what we can see empirically, you know, 1%. Now you may say 1% is not that interesting, but over, you know, 50 years, if you can do 1%, a little extra, you know, remember, remember my daughters, right? I'm trying to create a product for them. Uh, and, you know, why is this not so interesting for Wall Street? Because there's not a lot of turnover on the trading. Um, uh, also, you know, not a lot of um, um, a movement in terms of, you know, a fear, hey, something's happening in the market, you know, you should go to cash, right? It, this, this is a long-term type strategy. It's, it's great for retirements for your kids and so forth, I think personally, right? Okay, so where are we at right now? We built the extraction tools and the algorithms is sitting in the cloud. Uh, right now we're working on the trading platform and eventually we'll have to go out and do some marketing and distribution of these products and then we'll continue to write uh, papers. Who's on the team? It's myself and Ahmad Ajak. We both um, teach at Johns Hopkins in the business school. Prior to that, both of us worked on Wall Street. So we have some experience there. We share a same mentor, Jerry Basil, who's been fabulous in terms of mentoring us in our careers, but also giving us feedback on this product. Um, and then 
I think uh, in conclusion, that's the idea, it's simple ideas on Wall Street. We're rethinking and we're focusing on the corporate bond side of Wall Street. And you know, with that, I'm gonna conclude and Kyle, please jump in here with any questions and um, feel free to contact me. Here's my um, email. And uh, you know, uh, we've written some articles on fixed income, happy to share those with you as well. Um, and then if you guys have any questions um, and any um, comments, uh, and you know, we're looking for strategic partners to work with. We're, we want to engage the community. We want uh, people to be thinking about it, challenging us at, at every step of the way. And you know, when we're building this infrastructure, we're thinking about how do we put in best practices for scalability at each point, all right? So Kyle, with that, I'll stop. Feel free to. This, this was perfect. I, I, I had to turn my camera off because I was taking notes. Uh, <laughs> this is too exciting. Um, so, so thank you very much, Jim, for, for presenting this. And uh, if you can afterwards, just uh, since we're connected via email, send me over the links. Um, and I'll, I'll help distribute those to, to the audience. So uh, those that are listening, don't worry, I'll drop those into the comments uh, later today um, from, from Jim. But, uh, you know, Jim, you're know, talking about kind of the, the disrupting uh, factor here and, and leveraging fintech to, to look at Wall Street uh, differently. I mean, Wall Street itself is evolving and changing, right? Uh, in our last panel, we talked a lot about digital currencies and how that all may be playing. Um, since you're a teacher of this, would love to see or hear your opinion, excuse me, on, on where we go next. So now that you've kind of found this, this open opportunity, leveraging technology, again, pushing the bounds of fintech, um, how does digital currencies or how do you see that evolving in another step as things become digitized uh, in, in maybe one or two steps forward in the future? Uh, because... This platform you're building is is outstanding. It's it's going to be something again we've talked about already, as you said. That's not really there opening it for us. So now looking forward ahead in terms of the next level of fintech, what are your views on kind of where we go, what we do? So you know it's always dangerous to try to predict the future, but since I'll, I'll put my ivory tire cap on and I'll you know throw out <laughs> my predictions, but I think what's going to happen here is that um, you know it's not just one country, there's a whole world. And the countries see blockchain, they see the internet, they see the opportunities and they wanna participate in economic developments and they wanna emerge their marketplace, right? And so there's certain places that will allow a lot more FinTech to sort of evolve before they start to put some uh, fences around it, right? Mm -hmm. um, M-Peso is a fabulous example of um, how, um, you know, um, mobile wallet and transactions, this is sort of bank for the unbanked, just exploded. Yeah. People want a chance to be an entrepreneur, just give them a mechanism and just store value, like a minimum amount of value. The friction is obviously, you know, you need a certain amount to put money in a bank account to enter the financial systems, right? So I foresee emerging markets and regulators who are like, you know, hey, come over here and do it in our market, such as Singapore and, you know, but it's gotta be big enough, incredible enough that people are interested to do that. I mean, I, I think what's gonna happen is that the US will see some of this and, you know, maybe it's in Asia, I'm not sure which country, but there are countries that, that, that more of the population are trading Bitcoins, they're familiar with Bitcoins, they understand the sort of blockchain technology, they see the opportunities, they are um, helping entrepreneurs, right? Encouraging them to take risks, right? And so I think if you see one of those things start to explode, the regulators in the US will say, hey, why are we missing out? These are startups, these are companies, these are jobs. That's what we should be doing here, right? So I, I think unfortunately it's gonna be sort of forced on the outside. I'd love to go down to DC and talk to all the regulators and say, as a professor who teaches an entrepreneur, let these guys do what they're gonna do. Nine out of the 10 are gonna fail anyhow, but not because they did any fraudulent thing. It's just so hard to start a business, right? right. And you know, I, I, but but the, th the thing is that um, if the U.S. gets behind it, I mean, even like creating a sandbox around Baltimore and say, hey, look, if you start a crypto company in Baltimore or in D.C., right, as long as you tell us who you are and what you're doing, maybe we put it on our blockchain so we can have transparency, go at it, right? As soon as you cross the line and you do something illegal, obviously, we're going to we're going to prosecute you. But if you're you're sincerely trying to do um, some kind of fintech, right, and create jobs and start a company, by all means, we encourage that, right? We're not going to come in here and you know knock you down. So I, I think it's going to be a combination of outside forces, 
um, success outside the US, uh, realizing that we're, we're getting behind the curve. It's kind of like how, um, remember the telecommunication towers in the US were all analog, Asia went purely digital, that was the way to go. All of a sudden the US said, we gotta catch up, right? And they said, oh, no, turn down, take down these, these, these uh, you know, put up the digital stuff. Now we're re running off to 5G, right? And so, you know, outside, maybe it's China, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's Korea, maybe it's Taiwan, I, I don't know. Uh, someone's gonna move very quickly. Um, maybe it's the Philippines and, um, and then we're gonna notice the, the, the unicorns that are, you know, sort of getting birthed out of there and the number of jobs. And I, I think that, you know, we can, um, you know, try to catch up quickly. Uh, the talent in Silicon Valley is extraordinary, but, you know, Silicon Valley has certain talents. We have great talent up and down this East Coast and, you know, everywhere around America, you find a really good engineering school and you find a good business school. And, you know, you, you always have that um, entrepreneurial spirit, I think, which is great in America. And I think we should absolutely um, harness that. People come over here, right, to do amazing things. I think everybody's sort of seen what Elon Musk has done with SpaceX. And, you know, it takes us to the next level. And we need more of that risk taking and we need more of that encouraging. You could imagine what would happen if the government down in DC said, oh, nobody else can build a rocket ship except for NASA, right? Right. It, it, so, Right. I think people are starting. We did, we did see it. We did see it. Yeah, right? I mean, the, the space it. program was dead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now there's new life in there, right? So this this combination of um, the commercial side and also um, you know entrepreneurs really pushing the envelope, I think, is just wonderful and beautiful. Um, I'm part of an entrepreneurial organization, and I hang out with these entrepreneurs all the time. I love it, you know. And you know, I challenge the business school students. You know, after you're done, a lot of them want to do consulting and whatever it is, and investment banking. Um, I say, hey, you know, the real challenge and the hardest thing to do in business, at least from my perspective, is to be an entrepreneur, right? Because you have to use so many of your skill sets. But um, yeah, so Kyle, thank you so much. I yeah, really yeah. appreciate it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I got, one more, I got one more question for you, if that's okay. Absolutely. Awesome. So, so we actually, about a, about a week ago on a, on a previous episode of, of VCTV, we, um, we talked to the panel about the future of fintech. And you touched on this. I'd love to go maybe one level deeper and hear your thoughts is, you know, a lot of the emerging markets, um, whether unbanked or banked, is, it have been a great testing ground uh, for the future of, of financial technologies, whether that's in the blockchain or, or digital asset space, whether that's fintech pure or something in between. Uh, you touched on this moments ago, but what are you seeing? I mean, we talked about Latin America, so the, the entire LATAM uh, market. We talked a little bit about Brazil and, and Argentina. We talked a little bit about Africa during that panel. Um, Asia was the obvious one, right? We've, if you go for, through progression, I mean, you know, Europe was using credit cards with chips while we were still writing checks. We're still writing checks, but a few <laughs> years ago, we started using credit cards with chips, while Asia five years ago and, and further... We're using, you know, everything in a mobile contactless way. Um, would love to hear further your views on, on these emerging markets. And are they a testing ground? Are they um, really a first market entrance, right? Where entrepreneurs should be paying attention and maybe relocating to build those infrastructures? Because um, this is a long journey. Let's, let's add that, right? This is not something that's going to happen overnight, as we spoke about before. This is, a, this is a 5, 10, 15, 20 plus year journey redesigning some of these, um, call it uh, financial piping or this financial infrastructure. So we'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this as we wrap. So my view, and they're just my own views and whether this plays out or not, I think you know if I had to suggest what kind of FinTech to focus in on, right? For the future, it's gotta be mobile something, okay? Because everyone has a mobile phone. And you may not have a bank account in an unbanked country, but you have a mobile phone, right? So, and then understanding what the problem is. And a lot of, you know, people get caught up in the technology, but after the fact, there's some kind of reason why people are using this technology. I don't even think they care if it's blockchain or, you know, centralized or decentralized, as long as it works and it helps them, right? So they're thinking about what's the ROI for me, right? And I think people have to sort of think about that and they have to go out in the market and look at, you know, where's the problem? How do you create a solution? The reality is we have so many great smart blockchain and you know coders and engineers, but we haven't really found the real problems that you know this stuff is going to really solve, right? So the ROI is very important. So you know my, my suggestion would be at least go out there, try to identify the problem. 
you know, if you get the funds funding, you can absolutely put together the smartest engineers to solve those problems. But, you know, you, you need to find what the problem is after the fact, you know, OK, that makes sense. Everybody wanted their wallet because they want to do commerce and transactions. But unfortunately, the mechanism is limited to SMS messages. So you have to focus it in there. Right. I think a lot of us get caught up in the solutions and my, myself, too. I love technology. I love pushing the envelope. I get caught up on some crazy machine learning AI project. And I'm like, what, what are we doing here? Well, I don't care. It's really cool. Right. So the balance between uh, actually building a business and sustaining something, because remember, you have to generate revenues, right? Or unless you want to do charity, that's fine, too. Or, you know, there's a social um, entrepreneurship, which is also interesting, but you have to at least sustain, right? Even in that endeavor. So what, what I think is um, you have to talk to a lot of people uh, and then people are like, oh, Professor Lou, everyone's going to steal my ideas. They're going to steal my... The reality is it's really hard. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing, but, you know, good luck. There's, we, we got a team of about eight or nine now, right? We've been, they've been working very hard. We've been working very hard on this. And, you know, we'll show you where to go and do whatever we're doing. But the reality is day in, day out, it takes a lot of hard work, right? Now, mm -hmm. I think people don't realize that the, the, the idea usually is pretty simple. The really difficult part is actually, you know, just doing the work because the work eventually gets boring. <laughs> and then- <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, you, look, execution's everything. Ideas are a dime a dozen. You're not the first. And and even with what you presented, it's not the first time someone has thought about it as you said, but you are the ones executing on this. And I think that's a very important uh, you know, lesson for us to close off on here to to our audience is, you know, it's all about execution, right? You you put the team or you have the idea and you put all that together and then you execute. It doesn't matter if if you talk to 10,000 people about your idea, it's about your execution and you solving the problem and the team that you're bringing together to do that. And Jim, you and your team are, are, are doing a wonderful job at that. And we're excited to see how everything progresses with, with SoCat and uh, awesome uh, job on, on naming the company after your daughters and preparing for their future. So um, as we wrap, where can everyone find you? And again, send me those links, I'll share them with everybody um after the show as well absolutely so i'm on linkedin please find me uh let's be friends let's figure out how we can do a win-win we, we need to do some business together we need to uh you know get the 30 percent unemployment rate down in the u.s right so uh we are very business friendly and we're we're happy to work with you know um you know most people out there the other thing is that um you know uh, if you're interested in, in um collaborating we're open too so awesome um the other thing is, Kyle, you know, if you're ever in Baltimore, I don't know where you're located, you know, come on by. Uh, we throw some conferences down in D.C. I'll try to get you in as a moderator because obviously you're very good at doing these things. And, and hopefully I'll see you on the East Coast. I usually try to travel up and down the East Coast to the, the L.A. Token Conference. I think it's really fun and interesting. And this TV thing, amazing. I can learn see so many people and just learn so much just sitting at home. Uh, next time I'm going to bring my daughters and, you know, watch some of these interviews, but, you know, keep up the great work. Um, if you need anything, let me know. Okay, Kyle. Thank you so much, Jim. We appreciate it. Thank you. And, and have a, have a great day. And uh, to your audience, as Jim said, you can find them everywhere. I'll make sure you get those links, Jim. Thank you. Have a great day uh, and best of luck with SoCat. Looking forward to its progression. Um, to our audience, as Jim transitions off here, we're going to welcome on our next guest. And again, I'm Kyle Ellicott, your host. Uh, for this edition of VCTV. Uh, and a big shout out to Elena and the LA Token team, as always, for bringing us all together and to you, our live audience, for being with us. Um, as we go through these conversations and these panels, always feel free to drop in your questions. We'll try our best to answer them or bring them in the end. And again, all of our speakers are available on every social media as they toss out for us. So, um, plenty of opportunities to connect with them afterwards. And I'd love to welcome back another guest uh, that we had recently, Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, Kyle, good to see you again. Thank you, you as well. And, and, and to our audience, you know, today I, I wanted the chance to kind of go one level deeper from our last conversation about uh, you know, the future of food tech and really bring on one of the experts on, that we had on the panel. And uh, like I said, kind of go further down and. Brian has a, a tremendous amount of experience, which I'll let him kind of introduce in not just food tech itself, but also in CPG, in retail, and then moving into hospitality and travel. And I, I would love to get your thoughts on that. So uh, mm -hmm. Brian, before we get too deep into 
um, you know, this panel. And again, to our audience, we're going to be talking about food marketplaces and the impact that technology has has created on the role of all of these things. So how we think about, how we consume, how we purchase, and then also to Brian, how we invest in the future of our food and and the like. So Brian, quick introduction. I I went too long. So quick introduction from you. Uh, well, um, my uh, career in food started out in journalism and research. Um, I worked for a number of years after college at a, a think tank in Washington, D.C., sort of crunching numbers on global food trends, um, as well as global environmental trends. And, and that was a sort of a, a foundational connection for me that the way we farm, the way we grow food, the way we eat on this planet is the single biggest way in which humans touch our landscape, uh, water quality, land quality, air. Um, and and in, you know, as we're learning recently, it's really the essential industry, right? It's the one that we can't do without um, the food chain from farm all the way to our, to our houses. Um, th that uh, really sort of, uh, I uh, transitioned uh, about 20 years ago into food media, specifically in one was uh, one of the founders of the Edible Magazines Network in New York, uh, a local food and drink uh, publication that exists in about 100 communities throughout the United States, um, not international um, yet, although we always did have dreams about, you know, an edible Berlin, Tokyo, Sao Paulo, we would, you know, oh. Sydney, we would brainstorm where would we go once we jumped out of the US. Um, uh, but that really immersed me in the food community in the New York metro area. Um, and a number of years ago, when there was all this sort of buzz about technology moving into the food chain, I really became interested and obsessed and deep dived into it and focused my own writing and a lot of our journalism at Edible on food tech. And was it helping us eat better? Was it helping us farm better? And I saw a lot of stuff I was excited about. Around that time, I was transitioning out of media and thinking that I may have a role to play in terms of research and diligence and strategy for investors in the space. And, and right around that time, the last five to 10 years, there were a lot of new investors in food across the board traditional investors, tech investors who were very interested in food. I think of, you know, folks like Kimball Musk, uh, who sort of like crossed the line between tech, but he's also a restaurant owner. He's a very early investor in indoor ag and all sorts of food chain software. Um, and, and I landed ultimately working with um, a couple of different uh, venture funds. Um, uh, one in New York, uh, Almanac Insights. Uh, we are a um, $30 million fund uh, focused on investments throughout the food chain that are having a positive transformative impact. Uh, that's everything from CPG, as you said, to restaurants, hospitality, and farm uh, supply chain uh, solutions as well, some ingredient technology. Uh, and then I also work with another fund called Belltown Farms, which is a large-scale organic farming operator um, and has a strategy around buying farmland in sort of target locations at certain price, um, transitioning it to organic and then uh, developing the relationships, the offtake and harvest relationships with large CPG companies, large organic breweries, um, other buyers of organic um, commodities, which, uh, which are sh sort of, there are bottlenecks in that supply chain uh, and there are still very good price premiums. And then finally, I'm also excited to say I am working um, part-time with a venture fund based on Kauai in Hawaii. Uh, it's called Common Ground and uh, um, uh, it, it, it's a, <clears throat> a fund that's attached to a farm uh, on Kauai, an 80 acre organic farm um, and sort of community learning center. Uh, but they created a small investment fund for Hawaii, Hawaii based um, food and beverage companies they're using all Hawaii grown ingredients. Wow. Wow. Um, so you're really playing the entire spectrum. I mean, you came from media. So we, we all know that that simple story and how that, that evolves. But then you went into, I would say, all sides of the table. I mean, you're doing research. You, you've come from media. You're now in venture. You're working with the farms. You're, you're, you're helping to bridge that gap between, you know, uh, farm to table, but really farm table to, uh, you know, 
brick and mortar in some cases. Yeah. This is fascinating. Um, this is this is crazy. I, I would love to talk before we get into the big questions. So Bell Tower, uh, Bell Town, pardon me. Bell Town Farm. Common yeah. Ground. Thank you. Bell Town Farms and Common Ground. So these are two funds or venture groups that were started off of a farm. Um, is this a trend that you see? And is this really starting to help improve uh, the future of our, our food, right? Those future supply chains, whether technology is being digitized or, or not, do you see this as a big upward trend? It, it, it is a bit, it, I'd say it is a trend. It's still very early. Um, and as Belltown points out, you know, their plan in terms of the amount of farm they plan to purchase in the next two to three years based on the amount of money they've raised to buy that land. If they succeed, buy all the land that they're hoping, convert it all to organic, um, they will still represent less than 1% of all the organic acreage in the United States. So they're, they're very small and they'll be the first to admit that. And organic acreage in the United States is still just 1% of the total acreage in the United States. And that's growing, but it's still very small. So yes, I think farmland, in, farmland investment as a strategy is not that new, uh, prudential you know, the Canadian government employees pension funds. I mean, large institutional investors have bought forest land and farmland for a long time. What is new is buying it with a strategy of managing it better. So you have companies like Farmland Ventures and Farmland Partners, there a few, not many of them have sustainability focuses um, or sort of, you know, you know one eco label they're going after. Cliff Bar, uh, which does some venture investing, that company, they now have a farm venture fund where they're looking to invest in farms that are related to their own Cliff Bar supply chain. So if it's a hazelnut farm or an organic oat farm, they're going after supporting farms that grow ingredients they're gonna buy. So that thinking that you're describing where it's like holistic across the supply chain, I mean, it's also what we used to call or what, what is called vertical integration, I'd say that is starting to happen more and more throughout the sort of sustainable, organic, eco-labeled food supply chain. Uh, but it is still relatively early. And I think what Belltown Farms is doing is quite fascinating. You can look more, at more information at belltownfarms.com. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think, I, you know, I, I kind of, it took a few years to transition and I did land in this industry and, and I'm grateful to because I feel like I'm having quite an impact. I mean, that was always the appeal of media was you could get a story out there, have an impact on how people are thinking about food. Um, I like the idea of investing, uh, also having, having an impact and, and having, um, you know, I, I like the idea that as I've been in investing for three plus years full time, uh, I can say definitively that that is also an important way to have an impact um, when you're supporting those companies that are representing that new sort of food system we're interested in. So the synergies you describe have worked out okay. Yeah, and I think it's, 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 it's fascinating to look at that again, that whole picture, right? So very, very, for those maybe unfamiliar, right? Generally, it's a direct venture investment. It's maybe an investment into a CPG, or it's kind of in a cash flow generating business. And now, um, you've got this whole new category that's really starting to rise. And when you put it in that bigger picture of the supply chain, uh, which you commented on earlier in the week, and and just did again, is that has been dramatically changed. And if anything has more demands now than ever uh, with what's going on in the current era that people want more transparency, they want to know where things are coming from, you know, fresh or non-fresh, healthy, non-healthy, organic, non it doesn't matter. They just want that, um, that process uh, a little bit more transparent with added trust. And I think this is that Very kind of- trend, yeah. Yeah, it's a missing piece, right? We, we create accelerator programs and, and, and I've, I've been there as well. And you create accelerator programs that are very focused, right? A venture fund focused on an industry, investing in early stage technology to develop or something else. Right. Now, this is that piece, literally from the ground, from the root, all the way through to, to our, uh, our plates. It's, it seemed like the missing piece. And now we've got that whole picture together, which leads us into 
you know, where do things go from here? What's changing with the intersection of food and technology uh, as this all comes together? Okay, well, I mean, it, it, I think you've described it really well. I mean, that's exactly the sort of ecosystem I look at all day long. And um, just to emphasize, you know, more traditional investors, large traditional investors are getting into food for the same exact reasons you're talking about. And that was a trend I would say that was happening over the last few years. I mean, I, I would kind of call it like the post Michael Pollan trend. So, you know, the food writer, Michael Pollan, now a Berkeley professor, now just a genius guy. Um, I would say his books, his series of books on food were a type of watershed moment for like American and global food realizations. And so, so many of the food innovation startups and the food tech companies from Open Table and Blue Apron to Granular and Climate Corporation, uh, Farmer Business Network. I mean, some of the ones that are unicorns and have is sweet green, uh, you know, uh, some of our portfolio companies, I would say these were, these were all founded in what, you know, you might call the post Michael Pollan era, right? So they were not founded to just sell junk food. They were founded to fix the food system, right? And companies like Pepsi and McDonald's maybe have evolved, but they were not founded to fix the food system. McDonald's was not founded, you know, it was, a, it was purely a, sort of a taste, convenience, pricing, how can we get burgers to people? Um, and by the way, that movie Founder with Michael Keaton, I don't know if you've seen it. I mean, since everyone's yeah. watching lots of TV now, about the story of McDonald's. Oh my God, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. I, the yeah. book's even better, by the Highly way. The book's even, yeah. yeah, the I book's even better. It. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. I like Michael Keaton, but I'm sure the book's. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, so that transition did happen where the, some of this investing is becoming mainstream, but I think there's still a lot of neglect of food in the, it, from the investing landscape. It's complicated. It's very analog. Um, you know, it in many ways is still like our most analog essential industry, right? I mean, it's almost like garment. You're working with a raw material. Um, but what I wanted to say, the evolution that's also changed the investor landscape is I'd say there's two, you can break it down two ways. There's sort of tech interest in food and that's software moving into the food chain, robotics, automation, hardware, uh, and just technology solutions around food. And, and that gets to the points about transparency and um, you know, using solutions like blockchain or you know, other sort of digital tracing systems, uh, even some hardware around analyzing food safety and food quality. Um, and that is fascinating. Um, I think not all of those solutions are actually improving the food system. They might be solving other problems. They might be squeezing out profit or making marketplaces more efficient. But the other innovation that, that is really fascinating and exciting for me is what I would just call food innovation. You know, the, the whole, the, the sort of whole new ways of thinking about how we eat what ingredients go into our food. So I, I think of the explosion of alternative dairy plant-based milk, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were, if I were to tell you that 50% of American households right now um, have both a plant-based milk and a dairy, a milk milk in their fridge, you know, you might be surprised. That That's the reality right now. That's how Huge. quickly that three or four years ago, no one had oat milk in their fridge. You'd have soy milk, maybe you'd have almond milk, but there's been a crazy explosion, not just in people embracing it, but the options out there. Um, there's a lot of that sort of innovation happening as well. And that can be quite disruptive, right? I mean, you're making milk from oats as opposed to from a dairy herd, right? That's incredibly disruptive. And then a little further out on the time horizon, of course, there's cultured meat, there's cellular meat, um, all of which is, you know, they're, they're moving towards launch dates for these sorts of products. And of course, Beyond Meat, Impossible Burger would be other examples of that sort of alternative. But I would say just the phenomenon of online grocery is disruptive in that same way. Yes, it's technology solutions, but it's more just a whole new way of thinking about how do we get our food to our house. Um, so that's something that I'm, I'm also excited about analyzing from the perspective of does it help us eat better? Does it help us eat more healthy? Does it help us farm better? And, and to your point, um, I think there's both awareness moving and investors pushing food in more mission focused directions, um, you know, which makes me optimistic. Yeah, and I, I think you know, the food innovation side, I, I'm with you, tech interests, 
that's that's pretty clear. Um, you know, we've got uh, uh, you know coming from my background of of spending time in the Internet of Things, uh, I've seen ag tech and robotics and, and really sensors, that, sensors, sensors vertical off. farming. Right. Ton, you know, indoor farming, there's tons of stuff that's happening, you know, how and where that plays out. I think uh, some of it will be great. Some of it, like you said, just it's just an evolution of what we already had. It's not really improving anything. But the food innovation is very, very interesting. And you bring up dairy. Right. We have alternative meats. So we uh, we had uh, Bellina on last uh, last week on the show right. from from higher stakes. Uh, you know, I think that area is fascinating. But now switch that to other alternatives, right? So you have alternative dairy. Um, so you've got cheeses, you've got eggs, you've got this whole new world um, that is exploding around that innovation piece. And whether it's this current era or it's just people thinking differently because of the options, as you said, we're seeing a ton of that. And I think one of the only barriers I'm seeing on, on the investment side really is price. All right, so that's a determining factor for consumers, um, whether you're getting it in the store, if you can find it, which is another issue, or through online. But what are you seeing as some of the roadblocks to maybe food innovation really uh, taking a mass adoption approach for us as consumers? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, on a lot, on some levels, the main roadblock is our food system. And I'll just generalize, I'll just talk about the United States, which is a proxy for a lot of the rest of the world. Um, you know, we are top three agricultural nation along with China and India. We're, so we're big, right? Um, uh, you know, our food chain is not very diverse on almost any level. So you think about major commodities, you know, we're growing, it's really a handful, it's corn, it's soy, it's a few others. We figured out a lot of ways to use those feedstocks and do creative things, but the real, the real growth potential, the real interesting potential is when you look at what are called minor crops. So, you know, the oats, the peas, um, and really, that's just the beginning, you know, dozens and dozens of plants that we know we can grow well, sweet potatoes, um, you know, all sorts of um, products that could maybe play a much larger role in the same way that corn and soy do. Um, so some of, one of the big barriers to innovation is simply that we don't really have supply chains for a lot of these novel ingredients. Um, and especially when you talk about, you know, insect protein or, you um, uh, there, there's a company that, that um, is doing some really interesting stuff called Plantable, and it grows a plant called Lemna. The common name is duckweed. It's a very hardy plant, grows in ponds and, you know, even in sort of irrigation ditches. And they've uh, determined, the founders of Plantable have determined that Lemna has a, a plant-based protein that actually has a lot of the same qualities of, of uh, um, milk protein and egg protein. So, you know, you can kind of blend it into things. It acts like butter when you bake with it. Um, and so they're building these, these duckweed farms. Uh, you know, they're fairly early, but they have a plan to scale up. They're talking with major CPG companies who want to buy the product because it's economical, because it doesn't have any off flavors, because it's vegan, you know, it's plant-based. Um, but they're building their supply chain from scratch, you know. Um, so that's starting to happen, but we're early on. I would say the indoor ag supply chain is also, um, I don't think we realize how early on we are. You know, another sort of 1% number um, is, you know, currently 99% of all the food we eat on this planet is soil based, right? Mm -hmm. Even those giant greenhouses you've seen in, you know, outside of New York City or Las Vegas or in Asia, where indoor ag is taking off, they're not producing that much in total. So we're really very much at the beginning of that industry. And that's a barrier in and of itself for, you know, their supply chain of ingredients and products. And that's part of the reason you've seen them raise so much money uh, to build their facilities. Um, I mean, th those are some of the barriers. Um, I do also think that that uh, throughout the food chain, from farmers to co-packers to slaughterhouses, um, this is still a very analog industry. And the whole idea of digital, you know, um, optimizing the digital side, using digital tech, you know, using any sort of uh, tech to optimize a slaughterhouse or, you know, um, strawberry picking. I mean, all these sort of fundamental parts of the food chain that it's not abundantly clear 
how do um, you know it's it's not abundantly clear how you do even use technology in those settings. So when there is a technology that comes forward, adoption can be quite slow. Even though farmers incredibly innovative, always open at looking at technology, adoption can be slow. And at the same time, there are counterexamples. Farmer Business Network, as one example, I mean, they're up to 10,000 paying users in North America. That's a lot of adoption. I think over 40% of American acreage somehow is on Farmer Business Network platform. Um, but, but again, um, you know, the, the, the lack of diversity, the monotony of our food chain for the most part, I think is a barrier to innovation. Yeah, and I think another point too, to add on to that, just with what you just said of, you know, timing is, I think we forget, um, you know, a farm, right? Going back to that soil example is an entire business in itself, right? It is a corporation, right? We try to inject new technology into a corporation Yep. That is an infrastructure change. An infrastructure change requires a long time frame. It's not quick, right? We talked about uh, blockchain and also digital assets in, in previous episodes of VCTV today. And that's not happening in 30 seconds. That's, that's taking years to integrate. And same with this technology and innovation coming into the farm. A farmer may be like, we got 80 acres or, or 800 acres. To integrate this simple piece of technology, and we'll just use like vertical farming as the example, or indoor farming, <clears throat> that's a whole fundamental shift yeah. in how they may have been doing business for the past 20, 30, 50, 100 years. That's not going to happen overnight. This is a long-term play. I mean, look at the alternative meat space as well. Those, to build up those supply chains, part one, to, to do disruption um, locally, is part two, globally part three, then four, you've got a whole entire infrastructure to play out. And then new transitions into the distributors like CPGs, um, which I wanna get to in a second, but all of that, it's, it's something I think we tend to forget is a farm is a business. It is a corporation at the end of the day and it takes time. A hundred percent. And um, I mean, it's as you see how farms are trying to adapt in literally the last few weeks, <coughs> pardon me, in the United States, um, you know, farms who maybe relied on just having a farm stand or, you know, having 10 big restaurant customers because they've had the rug pulled out from under them. One in terms of, you know, the restaurant industry sort of shutting down uh, and two people buying differently, um, you've had all sorts of farms having to rapidly adapt and change and pivot. So you're seeing farms who maybe never interacted with the public launching a public facing side, like a subscription box, like a CSA, or taking their website, which they never relied on at all, and adding Shopify integration so they can use it like a grocery store. I mean, you know, these seem like, you know, simple things, but for, as you said, someone who's been farming and marketing food the same way for anything from five to 50 years, that's not easy. Those are costly and not easy changes to make rapidly or to do well. Uh, I mean, I have a farmer friend in my town and you know, she loves the fact that she doesn't have to interact with her customers. She knows it's difficult. Marketing is quite difficult. She loves the farming part. You know, that's why she has a business partner or hires someone to do that part. But now their operation is being forced to adapt in, you know, 10 new ways that they never even had to imagine. And I do think that flows all the way up to, to large food companies as well. I will say for my work in Hawaii, uh, we've been talking to some strategic partners who are household brand names in America. You know, King's Bread is a Hawaiian brand, Mauna Loa um, macadamia nuts, macadamia nuts in chocolate, Kona coffee. I mean, these are, uh, you know, uh, brands that have been built on the back of tourism. Uh, people know them because maybe they visited Hawaii or they got sent a gift from Hawaii. As we talk to companies like this about, you know, what is your clean, la what is your clean label strategy? You know, you're a big buyer in the macadamia nut supply chain. Have you thought about other macadamia nut products? Um, they want to adapt. They want to be innovative, but it, it can be quite slow. It can be quite slow at every level, at the level of leadership, the level of product innovation, the level of marketing. Um, and so a real risk, I think, in the food system that we see every day 
is there are so many legacy players in food that mm -hmm. just are not going to be able to adapt. Uh, I mean, dairy farmers in New York State would be a very good example, right? They're going out of business in droves, no matter, uh, and, and the ones that are succeeding are having to make radical pivots. Um, and I suppose also what you see happening with meatpacking plants in the United States right now um, in, in the face of illness spreading, uh, they are, are sort of entrenched in a way that they can't innovate. Um, and they're going to suffer, and you're definitely going to see I think all sorts of food businesses, unfortunately, closed down, um, you know, in, in the next few months, in the next few years. And maybe it's because, one, they couldn't keep up with, you know, basic innovation. Two, they're not keeping up with sustainability and sort of transparency trends, uh, which um, if you're not keeping up with those trends right now, it's that much harder to justify staying in business. You're too late, if, if in any case, right? And and I think that 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 uh, goes to show even with um, how retail is being affected with this, right? Retail had to make changes like that uh, in every way, from online to just general delivery to mobile to brick and mortar. Everything had to change. What are you seeing? And kind of skipping over CPGs, but playing into that retail spot. How is technology and, and everything that just happened? in the past six months, really shifting the way that you're looking at retail or, or even retail investments and how that landscape has dramatically shifted and probably will for, I mean, to be fair, and, I, and I'll go on, on on both sides as a consumer and as an investor, right. in, in my opinion, that has changed. And that is the change going forward where people are, and maybe not every day, every week, will get their groceries online, shipped to them, but maybe once a month, that's probably more than they were doing before. So what's your, what are you seeing on the side as well? Um, that is the biggest shift happening in food right now. No question in the food industry. Um, in America, um, you know, as of last year, roughly 50% of food dollars were spent um, on food in the home. That's all bought at, you know, food made in the home, but bought at grocery and to a lesser extent from farmers markets and that sort of thing. And then 50%, the other half was spent at restaurants, at fast food, at hotel um, cafeterias, workplace cafeterias. That 50%, the second 50% went away overnight, essentially went away overnight. So um, that's money not being spent in the same way because there's a lot of staffing involved in that food, but grocery had to absorb that much more of an increase. And so you saw people baking at home and people making their own desserts, things they couldn't easily get, so they had to make it. And that's what, that increased even more the amount of dollars that were going into grocery. So that's a crazy trend. And it's worth talking about grocery too because that industry is flush with money right now. It is revenue. Uh, it is going to become even more competitive. So they also have to be thinking about what's working, what's innovative. I mean, some of the things that I think we can assume for the foreseeable future, although no, no we don't, obviously, I don't know how things are going to play out. One, um, people are not going to go back into grocery stores in the same way that they used to anytime soon. So you're seeing uh, grocery stores reconfigure to create more space. You're seeing food brands cut uh, slash their advertising, their in-store advertising budgets to zero mm -hmm. across the board. So the whole idea that you're going to a grocery store for a shopping experience, which was kind of a, a, a revolutionary idea five, 10 years ago, I think it's what made Whole Foods the company it is. You wanted to go there to enjoy being at Whole Foods. That's not happening anytime soon at Whole Foods, at Walmart, at Kroger's, anywhere. In and out. Don't in want to talk to anybody. Just give me out. In fact, you're looking for alternatives. And those alternatives are ordering online, mm -hmm. shopping at a farmer's market, shopping at a farm stand. I mean, completely different outdoor experiences. Um, ordering meat online, you know, ordering bagels. I, I, you know, the bagel store in my town has been closed, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I occasionally look at the website uh, Gold Belly. You yeah. know, which is great for ordering, you know, presents for people, cookies. You know, there's 10 New York bagel vendors that are on Gold Belly. I ordered four dozen bagels recently, you know, from a Queens, uh, you know, Utopia Bakery, Utopia Bagel Shop. They're amazing. I can't get bagels like that anywhere near me anymore. And I'm not driving to New York City either. So 
you know, these are ways I wouldn't have thought about getting bagels a few months ago. And, um, but, but, you know, that's, a, this, that's kind of a blip example. I think grocery is gonna be forced even more to increase its delivery capacity into areas where it's not easy to deliver, including rural areas, including suburban areas. Um, and I don't even know what sort of solutions we're gonna get. Um, I think meal kits are gonna continue to evolve. Um, people are cooking more, but we're still valuing convenience. Um, and then a big macro trend is shelf stable is more and more valuable because everyone throughout the chain is maxed out in terms of freezer space, including households. Like I've got a buddy who orders crazy amounts of food from a big New York delivery company. He's got an extra fridge. You know, he can do that. He can put like six packs of bacon in his freezer. I don't have that space. Like we don't have a giant fridge. I don't want to buy an extra freezer. So Right. We're buying, uh, we actually were buying uh, one of our favorite brands, Organic Valley Milk, which we drink a lot of in our house. Um, they have a, uh, like an ultra pasteurized, you know, metal squishy container version. that's in like a 12 pack for like sending with kids to school. We've been buying that and keeping it in our pantry, not in our fridge, because we don't have any room in our fridge for that. So, you know, people are adapting in all sorts of ways. Um, and we're using more packaging. So the last thing I'll mention, I'm, I'm rambling, all across the food chain, in Europe, in Asia, in America, basically everywhere that started banning plastic packaging over the last few years, it's all right back. It's almost shifted back, including in the strictest countries in Europe, including in New York City. There's a premium on extra wrapping for the security, the sort of safety idea that you know no one has touched this. It's been wrapped since it left the factory. Um, and that's wild too, because packaging was moving in the complete opposite direction. Yeah, I mean, even just before all this happened, uh, to add on that, Blue Bottle Coffee, uh, you know, well-known uh, coffee company here in the Bay Area, and several others were saying they're going, you know, all paper base, yeah. right? right. Or, or bring in your own mug, and then, boom, that's done. That that no is over for the time mug. being. Yeah, no more yeah. bringing your own mug, which was predated this just out of convenience. People just want to bring their own mug. You know, you're not even allowed to do that right now as far as people are trying to stay open. So yeah, you're seeing, I think, you know, it's, there's a lot of sadness throughout the food industry. There's a lot of struggling. Uh, there have been obviously hospitality and food service in particular has been turned upside down. Yeah. Uh, out of that will come some, some brilliant ideas. You know, and, and the one silver lining is there's going to be some real forced innovation. Um, but I don't think anyone's happy about how rapidly and how, you know, sort of painful this has been. Yeah. And, and I, I apologize. You did, we didn't get a chance to dive into that, uh, in our we'll last panel. Hospitality another time with, um, what's his name? Thraxton. Uh, yes. Yes. And Thraxton sent me a message. He wants to do another one, but, but on that note, let's, cause I'll say this back to your, to previous point. So delivering increasing to rural areas. I couldn't agree more. I think we, we spoke about this as well about data, the amount of data that just got consumed. You know, let's say everything goes back to normal tomorrow. The data set that just got consumed, you just turned on one of the biggest infrastructure plays from tier one to tier two to tier three. So big, medium, smaller and smaller towns and cities uh, that you've ever had. So that infrastructure has now just been lit up you now will see that increase. I completely agree with that trend. I personally, I'm incredibly bullish on it myself. But uh, to, to, to get the last question in before we wrap up, um, hospitality. I do want to make sure you get a point in here. There, there is a, a huge sadness. A lot has happened. We don't know where anything's going to go or what's even going to happen in the summer um, as, as travel may or may not pick up. What are you seeing in terms of the shift positive or negative in hospitality and travel um, for, we'll just call it the foreseeable future? Uh, I mean, I think on the most practical level, what we're telling our companies that are, that are in hospitality, whether it's quick serve restaurants or some other restaurant dependent, uh, you know, food service dependent industry, um, you know, we're, we're obviously seeing, you know, revenue, Revenue projections revised way, way down. We're advising these companies as much as possible to sort of cut costs, extend, you know, reduce their burn, extend their runway. Um, 
what we're seeing is where able, where their space allows and their infrastructure allows, they are pushing out delivery. And so this sort of premium on delivery is, is there, it's real. Uh, you know, I think there's a major demographic in America that doesn't cook for themselves very well. Uh, and that's everyone from young people to old people. We're not really a cooking nation. Um, I have a friend in San Francisco who jokes that he does take in seven times a day for his family. And I know he's not exaggerating, you know, and probably if it's someone's birthday, they, they do it 10 times a day or something, you know. So um, that is going to continue to grow, continue to be competitive, interesting stuff there. You know, is it going to accelerate self-driving robot delivery, you know, delivery? Probably, you know, I don't follow that space so closely, but we need more delivery infrastructure. No question about that. There's still sort of backlogs. Um, there's a lot of tech. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, about hospitality. Um, I think the a whole idea of self-serve vending machines, uh, although I don't know how fast we can roll that out, companies like Farmer's Fridge and um, a small company in Colorado called Mama Gaia that basically have these smart vending machines that are restocked every day. That's a great innovation. That could be plunked down in an apartment building. That could be plunked down in a college dorm. If people don't want to eat in cafeterias, maybe they want to go to an outdoor kiosk that's replenished every day. So I think there's going to be cool uh, growth in that area. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of closures uh, in restaurants. I was listening to an interview with uh, the, the woman who's the CEO of Checkers, the uh, large sort of large restaurant chain in the America in, in America, and uh, she said they haven't seen this, but in her competitors, they've seen 20% location closure across the board. So if you imagine a thousand McDonald's, 200 of those McDonald's will close within the next year or two. So I think we're gonna see the weaker locations close. We're gonna see the weaker franchisee operators close. Um, this CEO of Checkers was actually optimistic that this is gonna increase customer flow to the better places. So maybe there will be some Darwinian evolution. Um, I'm still waiting to see the innovations that allow the talent that you have in a restaurant and chefs, allow them to make a good living. Because the really sad implications of all this would be um, if really we're just, you know, given the situation and given that people can't quickly get back into restaurants with a sort of business model of turning tables and packing people in, which doesn't just work from a business perspective, it's also a joy and human sort of conviviality perspective. You know, I mean, there's nothing worse than a giant banquet room that's quiet and you know, you're, what's better is a tiny little room where there's music and you're up shoulder to shoulder with people. And if we're not going back to that anytime soon, what are we gonna do with all the chefs? What are we gonna do with all the hosts? What are we gonna do with all the people who have that expertise on running a room like that at a small scale at a large scale? Uh, does this just accelerate the move towards quick serve? No question. No question. Uh, one of our portfolio companies, Sweetgreen, uh, you know, a hundred uh, sort of plant focused meal, a uh, hundred locations throughout the United States. Um, this has been difficult for them, but they are as busy as, as, you know, as they ever have been. Yes, people are not ordering work lunch, but they're ordering other things. Um, you know, the price is right. They have the delivery infrastructure in place. Um, restaurants that haven't made that dramatic jump to online ordering and delivery, they're really behind. They're really behind right now. And if that jump doesn't happen, whether you're talking about a mom and pop restaurant that still is not doing takeout, or you're talking about a chain that hasn't stepped on the gas, um, you know, that, that business is, is almost as good as dead at this point. Yeah. unfortunately. So I think we should definitely check back in a few months because uh, a lot's going to play out over the summer, as you said. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be fascinating and hopefully for the better, right? Even if there's some painful transitions, hopefully on the other side, it's a, it's a short gap and a, and a bigger opportunity. And, and Brian, I'm so sorry, man. We, we, yeah. we have to wrap, but I, I could, we could go on for another hour. This is absolutely fascinating and so great to have you back. And I'm already talking with Elena uh, we're we're going to have you back again. We're going to bring in Thraxer uh, and a yeah, few others. A I'll get a haircut before the next one. But um, Sorry, you right. both. But closing thoughts, and then where can everyone find you before we sign off here? 
you know, I'm, I'm, I just to end on a little more of a positive note, um, you know, I'm optimistic that there are solutions. I mean, I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that my town and lots of other towns are talking about basically closing down sidewalks and streets and having more outdoor dining spaces. I know a lot of farms. I live in a, you know, a fairly rural area, a lot of farms planning outdoor dining clubs in conjunction with restaurants. So people are trying to come up with ideas. That's not going to carry us through Thanksgiving and, and winter. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're all going to get better at standing outside in, you know, in jackets come that time. Um, you know, because because there's outdoor is a premium. And, and uh, you know, some of my mentors in the New York restaurant space very early on, they said that they said outdoor space is going to be a premium. If you are a restaurant with a rooftop, if you are a restaurant with a huge outdoor patio, that is so valuable right now for staging, for serving, for whatever it is. So there's going to be some, it's all the joy is not going to be taken away forever. I think we're going to see some movement back. Um, but I would just say that, you know, really for people who are wondering, you know, what to watch, I think it's this, this difference between staple food decisions and premium decisions. There's a lot of pressure on premium food right now. Will that exist? Will the premium restaurant experience exist? Uh, I think that's very hard to argue. Will the premium packaged food peer, uh, experience exist? We talked about champagne sales. Um, so how that plays out um, is gonna be really interesting. And there's just, you know, uh, what's gonna happen if, if budgets remain tightened from the consumer. You know, I think this is yet another reason why people are cooking more. It's very economical to cook. You know, it's very economical to make rice and beans and know how to do that yourself. Even if Taco Bell can sell it to you for five bucks, it's cheaper, a lot cheaper to make it at home. So same, same with banana home. bread. Same with banana bread. <laughs> <laughs> the banana bread. Well put. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, and that goes for a lot of different things. Um, so I think food at home will continue to be the big trend that, you know, we'll continue to hear about. Awesome. Obviously. I, yeah. I couldn't agree more. And, and where can everyone find you, Brian, as we, we sign off here? Um, I, I, uh, LinkedIn is great. I can post my LinkedIn, okay. but it's Brian Hall while LinkedIn reach out to me. And, um, and, and as I said, belltownfarms.com is doing interesting stuff. Get in touch with me about Belltown and almanacinsights.com. Um, but on my LinkedIn, you can see all the, the folks I'm working with. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. And I'll drop all the links that he mentioned great. in on uh, our comments afterwards. And Brian, again, I couldn't be couldn't be happier and thankful for you joining us today and looking yeah. forward to having you back. My pleasure. Uh, I look forward to the next time, Kyle. And uh, you take care, okay? Awesome. Thank you, you too. And to our audience, a big thank you out there. I really appreciate you staying through and joining all of these great conversations we had today on VCTV and hope you see uh, what's to come, whether you're in, on the investment side or on the building side as an entrepreneur uh, with the future of food and the intersection of technology and how this will all play into how we think, how we eat, how we consume, how we package, how we get food from the soil all the way to our plates. Uh, so again, thank you to our audience. Thank you to Brian. Big thank you to Elena and the LA Token team for all of the help bringing this together today. I'm Kyle Ellicott.